Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth annual SCNAA Clinician, Researcher, and Family Gathering. My name is Casey Craig, and I am the Executive Director. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Hillary's like, it's not me. <laughs> and I'm also the mama to Stella, one of my S our SCNAA warriors. Now, she needs no introduction, but I have here with me Hilary Zabois. She is our founder and now president of our board of directors and the mama to our original cute Esme. Hi, everyone. It is um, absolutely exceptional to be back in person and to see you as I can with the lights. It's, you're all it's a little... It's blinding up here. Yeah, people. it's a little blinding, but um, just so lovely to see everyone all in one room again. Um, last year we were together, uh, but without our families. Mm -hmm. And so, just so thrilled to see all of you and to stand up here again uh, for the eighth time. Yeah, exactly. After the three long years without seeing our families, it has been so fun to see all of your faces and give all of you hugs. I don't know if this is a record or not, but we have over 90 patients and family members here um, throughout the weekend. Yes, so exciting. And I am thrilled to announce that the Cute Syndrome Foundation actually paid for 19 of those families through a travel grant fully for them to come here. All travel and lodging expenses paid so those families could make it here. And I, this was just such a joy this year to be on the board and approve um, that spent to, to make sure that all of our families could be here regardless of the obstacles that they mm -hmm. might have to think about to, to get here. So yeah. it was really amazing and also I think pretty um, a moment to think back on the first time that we held this event, which some of you were in the room for, looking at you, John, and you, Minaj, um, and so many of our families uh, that were sort of the original group. And we were just a group of, I think it was like 25, and um, I remember planning that event with um, my former partner, Julianne, and um, being afraid that we wouldn't be able to pay for the food. You know, it was really important to do the event. We wanted to make it happen, but it was a stretch. And to be in the position now to be able to not only hold an event like this, but bring as many people as possible in is just such a joy. And I just am filled with gratitude. Um, to be standing here and, and have watched uh, the team make this happen this year. Yeah, and I think as we're kind of going down memory lane there, I wanted to point out that in 2017 was my first gathering and Stella had been diagnosed for about two years. And when I showed up, I expected to meet other families and make those connections. But what I didn't expect is to walk into a room filled with professional remarkably smart people that were fighting for my child. You know, when I walked into that room, I thought I was alone in this journey, and if Stella was gonna get anywhere, it was only because of me. But when I saw those clinicians and researchers and two industry partners talking about a possible clinical trial at the time, I was blown away, absolutely blown away. And so when I walked away from that event, I was extremely hopeful. And we all know as families that sometimes those days are really dark. And if you can think back on this event and look around the room and realize that you're not alone, we're all on this journey together, and there are people that you don't even know that their life's work is helping to increase the standard of care for your child. Absolutely. And um, I think that that was really part, you know, at the core of designing this event and the idea of this event was that we wanted families to have the opportunity to hear the science, even if some of it, you know, some of it were, we can't totally follow, um, or, you know, some of it's a bit confusing, but to see that work being done. And that was so important to us, and we were really, have always believed that that was essential to our mission. Um, and I think the thing that we missed in the first year, and Again, I'm looking at Minaj to, to uh, acknowledge that he brought this to our attention, that it isn't a one-way street. This is reciprocal, right? The things that the families are talking about, the things that you're sharing with the researchers and, and the industry folks in the room, um, they take it back to their labs. They take it back to their desks, and they, they keep going because they see our kids in this room, and they hear our stories over dinner 
uh, and it's really impactful and meaningful. So um, that's very much at the heart of, yeah. of this event. I also wanted to mention that 2022 is a huge milestone for the SCNAA community. 10 years ago, which when I think about 10 years ago for me, I'm like, oh, yeah, that would have been a nice, you know, 10 years ago being 30. But in the whole realm of the epilepsy world, that's not very long ago. And 10 years ago, we had Dr. Hammer discover SNAA. And here we are in a room filled with people, and we're getting ready to hear from two industry partners about one clinical trial that's in progress and one on the horizon. And, you know, as a family member and even honestly as a volunteer, I, I obviously knew that Hillary was having conversations with professionals and industry partners, but I had no idea what that truly meant until I became executive director and Hillary started showing me the ropes and I started going to these conferences and talking to other rare um, groups and they're like, how did you do it? And I'm like, I don't know. I just showed up. Um, so I, I, I think what it's just important for us to highlight on is really how remarkable it is that this small but mighty community has just powered through the epilepsy space and made a name for ourselves. Absolutely. And I think, again, just thinking about our partners and the, the relationships that we've established over the last eight years and 10 years um, due to the work that Michael's done, um, it's just, again, I think we, as Casey said, we don't always see it as families. We know the community that we know, but we don't understand uh, necessarily how quick this is in the, in the pace of um, in the pace of drug development, yes. in the pace of changes in, in clinical care. So we're really, really blessed. Absolutely. So our hope tonight is that everyone leaves this room feeling rejuvenated and empowered and energized and ready to go to fight for our community. I also want to take a moment to officially thank Hillary for all that you've done for our community. And don't worry, she is still a very integral part of our community. She's not going to get rid of, you know, I can't get rid of her. And I don't want to get rid of her. I need her up here with me. So we appreciate you so very much. And I just also want to say um, how much, what a joy it's been to pass along uh, the mantle to Casey, who's done a fantastic job this year. So Casey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, with that said, and, Hillary. And also, oh, just if you don't mind, yeah. just a nod to the, to the volunteer team. Absolutely. This is the first time I've ever come to this event fresh. Um, usually, I am behind the scenes doing the things. Um, and this year, I walked into this room not knowing what to expect, which is a great joy. Um, and I just want to say what a wonderful job everyone's done. All of the volunteers this year, as always, have shown up and done beautiful work. So thank you all. All right, with that said, Hillary gets to sit down and relax and enjoy a glass of wine. <laughs> All right, so we know that we always like to go over time, so we're going to try to be a stickler this year and keep on task. So we're going to go ahead and get started with cl the clinician roundtable. So I'd like to introduce Dr. John Stryber, the Director of Epilepsy Genetics Program and EEG at Children's National Hospital. He will introduce each clinician and the clinician panel. For those of you that are attending virtually, please um, feel free to ask questions. We want you to be involved in this process. So you can ask your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom webinar, and then we will make sure that your questions are asked here live. All right. Okay, just use this, yep. Okay, great. So uh, I had the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Scott Perry. He's from Cook Children's Hospital, although I end up seeing uh, Scott pretty much everywhere I go. At every meeting I go to, I feel like Scott's involved with this. He's, he's ubiquitous. He's involved in so much. So we're very happy to have him here. Uh, you might also know him as the uh, Notorious EEG. It's his Twitter handle, and follow him there if you don't already. Uh, but he's going to talk to us tonight about developing a uh, consensus guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of SEN 8A related disorders. So, Scott, thanks so much for joining. All right. Wow, those lights are bright. Okay. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Um, a really an honor to be able to come and, and, and talk to you all tonight. I do apologize. I've got to run right after this to another meeting. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to uh, tweet me your questions. I'll be happy to answer them uh, later. But I want to talk to you about our, um, our, uh, our project, as you said, which is the, uh, whoops, wrong way. The first global consensus for the diagnosis and treatment of SCNA-related disorders, which is a Delphi project. And this is a project I want to first you know, give a shout out to the International SCNA Alliance, who has really spearheaded uh, this, this project. Uh, they, brought, they brought me on not only because I, I see a decent amount of, of, of children with uh, disorders with SCNA, uh, but um, because they also needed somebody to um, probably like kick them along and, you know, run the project, which is what I'm good at doing is, you know, telling people to, like, let's move on and that's, let's get that out of the way and do something else and move forward. So that's kind of my part. So all of the work here is not my work. It's a lot of other people's work. My work is just to kind of shepherd it along. Um, so I'll share it, share it with you. So uh, I don't need to tell you all this, right, but um, the pathogenic variants in SCN 8A uh, present with a wide spectrum of phenotypes. And, and currently there are no real published standardized uh, practices. We certainly have some guidelines of how we want to go about it, but there's, there's not really any standardized practices for the diagnosis and management of these conditions. Uh, and this knowledge gap is particularly uh, impactful, and I'm sure some of you know, when you are seeing a provider who does not have any experience in SCNA day. Maybe they've never seen it. Uh, you know, many have never seen it. And so utilizing this modified Delphi process what we do is we, we take a, a global panel of, of experts, and I'm going to put that in air quotes because even the experts are not experts because we only have so many patients that we've seen with it, right, um, to develop our guidelines and develop consensus about a number, a number of things. And for this particular project, that's the diagnosis, the phenotypes, the treatment, and the comorbidities and prognosis of the condition. And then as part of this, not only do we develop a consensus, but we also develop areas where there's clearly no consensus. And if there's not a consensus, then that represents a knowledge gap. And now we know where we need to focus our attention um, to, gain, uh, to gain knowledge with uh, new research. So this is really small, but this is how a, a modified Delphi process works, okay? The first thing is you get yourself a leadership team that's going to kind of run the project, and you start with a very comprehensive literature review. So uh, for this, um, they partnered with uh, Combined Brain uh, to do an exhaustive uh, literature review of SCN8A related disorders. Uh, we then divide into work groups, and those work groups for this project were diagnosis and phenotype, the treatment group, and then the prognosis and the comorbidities group. Each of those groups reviews the literature that is available in their area. They may suggest additional literature that needs to be brought in and reviewed, uh, and then they um, kind of you know, classify and codify what is that literature. And that provides the basis for anyone who ultimately participates in the consensus to review so that they're kind of caught up and everyone's on the same page of what's out there in the literature before they start the process of answering our questions. We then develop a survey. Um, it's then up to the leadership team to take the um, questions that are proposed uh, and make the survey. And I'll tell you, these three work groups brought us uh, a little over 400 questions related to SCNA-related disorders. And then we have to take those 400 questions and whittle them down to as many as we think are necessary to reach uh, a consensus on important topics, but that are not so exhausting that somebody closes the survey and won't finish it. Um, so, and that's not an easy process. Um, after that, we, uh, the core panel, and the core panel again is made up of uh, both family uh, caregivers uh, and clinicians, uh, then nominates other people that they uh, know within the SCN 8A community uh, that have experience in the condition um, to be the, um, the larger panel that performs the consensus. And then what happens is we go through rounds. So we send out the, the questions, we get back the answers. Some of the answers we have consensus, some of the things we don't have consensus. If we don't have consensus, we then take that area, we ask more questions to try to get consensus. And then we go through, again, multiple rounds, and ultimately we'll either have agreement or we won't have agreement, and that's what we publish as the guidelines. So this is, I'm just going to go through a little bit of information. This is a high-level overview. If you want, there will be a poster on uh, Sunday. Um, that will cover all this, so I encourage you to stop by and learn more about it. But uh, basically, this is, the, this is the group that kind of made up the core panel. You can see it's a, a quite distinguished and very knowledgeable group of folks that has a great experience. 
Um, you can see there we had, uh, uh, ultimately, when we sent out the survey, had 29 clinicians, 13 caregivers that represented five continents and 15 countries. Uh, and that's important, that we have a global consensus on how um, to deal with these conditions. Uh, as you see, um, the experience uh, with SCN 8A for the majority was over five years. Um, and, and the experience with the number of patients uh, was, was generally in the single digits, though we do have some that are uh, in the double and some in China that even had experience with uh, triple digits. So the first and most important thing of this survey, and that really the whole survey like kind of resided on this, and if this didn't go well, it was all downhill from there, was that do you or don't you agree that the proposed phenotypes that we outline here uh, are the phenotypes of, of SCN8A? Do they, they well encapsulate SCN8A? And what you can see there is that we do have um, high consensus with either partial or full agreement that these five phenotypes are, um, are adequate to describe the phenotypes of SCN8A. What we're gonna do in round two is we wanna look really further in that because some people partially agreed. So if you partially agreed, why did you partially agree? If these, if these are not enough, what else needs to be thought of uh, as a phenotype? And, and is that important uh, as far as the treatment, prognosis, et cetera, go? Uh, then we ask questions about the presentation, and then we start to we start to get some themes here, and start to get some some stuff that I think would be you know maybe maybe for you all you're like yeah we knew that, but uh, think about the physician that doesn't know this, that's never seen SCN8A. This is starting to tell them that we have high consensus that severe DEE, the first symptoms are seizures and developmental delays, that the onset is early in life in the first six months, and that the age of developmental delay is within that first year, whereas mixed epilepsy is a later, a bit later onset, and the developmental delay is a bit later. And the generalized epilepsy presentation is, much, is even later than that. And so we start to get this consensus of how it will present. And then we get consensus about what types of seizures. So we, we, we agree that severe DEE uh, obviously involves lots of seizure types. Um, as you see listed, those in the green are the ones we have high consensus on. The mixed epilepsy tends to have uh, both uh, focal seizures and tonic-clonic type seizures. The generalized epilepsy, tonic-clonic type seizures and absent seizures. Uh, and then the selfie version may be focal seizures. And then the comorbidities. Uh, we have high consensus that the severe DEE form uh, of this condition comes with uh, multiple delays, uh, both fine and uh, gross motor as well as speech, uh, with intellectual disabilities, hypotonia, et cetera. We didn't really get consensus on the comorbidities that you find in the other phenotypes. Uh, and that doesn't mean there won't be a consensus. This means we need to go back to the drawing board and ask the questions differently um, and, and try to achieve um, some consensus of what one might expect to see. So in the second round, the second round which we're about to send out in the coming weeks is very focused on the comorbidities and not just the, um, do these comorbidities I have listed exist or not exist within these phenotypes, but then within the fine motor delays, within gross motor delays, what are those delays? What are those delays? What is the prognosis of that delay? Is there anything we can do about that delay to, to, you know, to treat it? Is there any, you know, anything that is effective? Then we looked at evaluation. Uh, evaluation, we had um, not much consensus yet, uh, and I think it's because of the way we worded the questions. Uh, as you can see there, we have consensus that the EEG is almost always abnormal in the severe DEE form, um, and that the MRI is almost never abnormal in the generalized epilepsy form, the selfie form, and NDD ID. Um, and a moderate consensus in some of the other categories. We're gonna ask these questions a little bit differently in the next uh, round um, because we're trying to get at, is the MRI ever abnormal? Is the EEG ever abnormal? Is the EEG ever normal? Because those are important things because we want you, you know, a newly diagnosed person goes to the doctor and they go, well, your EEG is normal, so you must not have SCN 8A, you know, whatever. We want them to know, no, that's not true. You can have a normal EEG and have this condition, but it may change over time, for example. We're exploring um, the functional consequences of the variants uh, and whether that means, you know, how you use that um, to, to decide what to do about treatment. Um, we've got to explore this further um, to, because the way we ask these questions were, um, you know, did the loss of, is the loss of function almost always present, which in this con 
our definition was like greater than 95%, right? And so we reached moderate consensus on that. So instead, we have to ask the question a little differently. Maybe do the majority of patients with this phenotype have loss of function versus uh, gain of function? Uh, and I do think we'll get to a consensus uh, with a lot of that uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then finally, um, we have treatments. We're going to explore treatments a lot more in the next rounds, too. But we can say from the first round that there's definitely consensus that there are optimal first lines of treatment for gain of function um, variants. And those are sodium channel drugs, tends to be oxcarb and carbamazepine. Um, we uh, have consensus that there are some medications that probably should be avoided, um, and levetiracetam. Uh, we have, uh, and for loss of function, we should probably avoid sodium channel uh, mechanisms of action. And we have consensus that resective surgery really doesn't have a place uh, in SC and 8A related disorders. We're going to explore further, though, in the next round um, how that dosing happens. You know, when do you go above the usual dose? When do you, um, you know, how do you decide how high you titrate, for instance, a sodium channel drug, et cetera? Uh, and then finally, prognosis. We have no consensus on these areas yet. This was a very small per portion of the first um, survey. We spent most of our time getting um, the initial kind of diagnosis treatment questions out of the way. We're going to explore this much more in um, the second survey that's about to come out because we'll be asking not only about the comorbidities, but as I said, do those comorbidities get better, get worse, not change? What leads to those changes? Uh, how do we treat it, et cetera? Uh, so that will come in, uh, in round three. So uh, what I can uh, conclude, this is really just a sneak peek. I mean, this is like a very high level of, um, you know, don't go home disappointed that we didn't reach consensus on a lot of things. You don't ever reach consensus on a lot of things after round one. You need multiple rounds to get that, but we will get there. Uh, but we did achieve consensus on multiple aspects of diagnosis, treatment, uh, counseling, uh, and most importantly, uh, I think, uh, you know, reached a, a consensus that uh, we, we agree that the five distinct phenotypes exist. I think we need to further explore whether there could be some more. We'll further explore in the next rounds, as I said, the comorbidities, uh, further the evaluation, treatment, and the prognosis of the condition. Um, if there are areas, again, where we can't reach consensus, one of the great things we can do is go to the global patient registry and say maybe the registry can tell us what we don't think, what we can't reach consensus on. Maybe the answer is actually in the database. We just need to ask it that question. Uh, and then, as you know, I hope you recognize, once we put all this together and have ourselves a formal consensus guideline for the evaluation and treatment of SCN 8A related disorders, this will become a very important document for physicians, uh, clinicians around the world, uh, particularly those who don't have experience in this condition. They can refer to something that tells them these are the things you need to do with this particular condition. Um, and so that, I think that's going to be a really important uh, step forward. So um, with, with that, uh, like I said, we'll continue to share some more uh, stuff. The International SCN 8A Alliance will be um, sharing this information uh, as, as it comes out, as, as we complete it, so stay tuned for that. And I think my last slide here is I just want to thank all the folks uh, that were involved. Uh, Elaine Rural from the Mayo Clinic has a lot of experience in Delphi projects, and so she's the one that is really the, the guide for how this is done. Uh, and then uh, Maya at Combined Brain has gone above and beyond um, to work on this um, project. Uh, and Jayetta, uh, also a great, uh, great teammate uh, to keep this project moving forward. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions if we have them. I'd like to look out and say, you know, I see some questions, but I can't see anything, so. <laughs> All I see is the sun. Thank you very much. It's um, um, really a um, nice um, initiative and probably needed for many, um, you know, genetic disorders. Um, one question is: um, I, I miss. I'm surprised that there was little genetic compared to, uh, given that it is a genetic disorder. Um, so many of the criteria shown, they of course they're clinical, right? Because it's, you know, I guess the majority of the panel are clinicians and not geneticists. Um, do, you, do you have an, 
Any suggestions or ideas how to include more the, you know, the genetic information? Because that could be valuable for, for very young individuals yeah. later on, just to be in a more in a predictive realm. Well, so, I, I mean, I guess I'll say, first of all, it's, it's not that there weren't questions related to genetics and its impact. It's that there's no consensus reached on that, so I didn't include those things in there that we'll uh, expand into further. I think we are a little bit limited with some of the more um, uh, specific and important kind of genetic questions that, that you probably have, because a lot of the people we're, we're surveying, like even, even though we've found, again, experts in SCN8A, and this is a problem with a lot of the questions of the survey. These are some of these people have experience with you know three or four people, you know. And you ask a question of like what percent of patients have this? Well, they've got three patients. So if their three patients had it, then maybe they're going to answer 100 percent. So you have to be very careful how we judge and ask those questions. So that does become more difficult in the genetics because of all the different you know possibilities that could impact it and their experience with it to answer the question. And we don't you know we have to be careful not to ask questions just because we want answers because then we get bad answers and we don't want to come out with a consensus that's full of bad answers just because people felt they had to answer the survey right so we try to ask questions of things that we think reasonably we can get an answer that is knowledgeable and factual thank you thank you very much thanks a lot y'all And uh, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Hammer. Uh, Dr. Hammer is at University of Arizona. He probably doesn't need any introduction, but I have to say one thing we share is we both direct an epilepsy monitoring unit. Mine is for humans, and, and Dr. Hammer's is for mice. And um, he's going to talk today about making sense of the different manifestations of SE and 8A. I could listen to him speak about anything. I try to join his lab meetings. Uh, for that exact reason, but it's a real pleasure to have him here talking tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to echo what Casey and Hillary were going on about uh, the progress that's been made in the last 10 years. I, I think we might have won the record for uh, the fastest rare disease getting from discovery to trial, and it's because of you all. And uh, today I want to highlight the contribution of the families. Uh, we can't do we're going to fill a lot of gaps with knowledge based on what you all experience and report to us in the registry. And so I'm going to, I'm going to try and uh, tell you a few things. Uh, I don't have time in 10 minutes to tell you all the progress we're making. I'm, I've had to choose 10 or 12 slides uh, that represent what I think are exciting things that will just be a, a little taste of the progress we're making. So it's already been said, and everyone knows, there's a very wide spectrum of phenotypes or clinical outcomes in this disease. And then the more we've discovered, the, the more families that come to us, the more that we filled in this very broad spectrum that ranges from no epilepsy, just behavioral or movement disorders, through benign familial epilepsy, all the way to severe developmental epileptic encephalopathies. Um, and so what I want to address tonight is a question a parent would ask. Um, Given my child's mutation, what does that mean for the future? I think that's the best way to characterize what I want to address today. But I'll get into some of the things that have to do with predictive modeling and things that we can do based on the full data that we are getting. And you'll see that um, we now have um, a fairly robust sample size of data from about 381 families. And what I'm showing here on the, on the left is the current age distribution of those 381 individuals. You can see it ranges up over 40 years. We have a 60-something year old. Uh, uh, and you can see the older, older individuals are the minor portion. And it does stack up at individuals that are 12. So these are in three-year bins, 0 to 3, 3 to 6, all the way up. And you can see the major peak is in the nine to 12 year old range is the um, age, the mode of the, of the peak. And then you can see there's about an equal sex ratio. There's a slightly more boys. It's statistically significant, but it's not probably biologically significant. And then you see that 10% of the individuals do not experience seizures, whereas roughly 90% do. But when we actually split that out, um, the first thing we need to do to try and deal with the spectrum is to say, well, where are the folks without, without seizures? And it turns out they fall mostly in the group of individuals that carry 
a loss of function variant. So most of our gain, I, I can't say 100% ever, but a, nearly 100% of the individuals carrying a gain of function variant experience seizures, whereas only 54% of those carrying a loss of function variant uh, experience seizures. And the word cloud is showing you that they experience uh, loss of function uh, individuals. Um, I shouldn't say loss of function individuals. One of the things I want to and train myself to say is to never define anyone by their variant. We need to stick with the clinical features, but the clinical features of those carrying a loss of function are shown in the word cloud with the size of the word being somewhat proportional to the number of individuals experiencing that feature. So what I want to do now is to say, it, 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 if you are diagnosed with an SCN8A disorder and you have a genetic test, um, it's not going to be very frequent that you're going to have your variant tested in a laboratory to determine the functionality of the channel. That's an expensive and difficult test. It won't be a lab test probably in the near future. So can we use just the clinical features alone to predict the uh, type of variant you have? So what I want to show here is, and I don't have time to explain how we did this, but this is a three-dimensional model showing you all the individuals that were in our truth set. So we gathered literature from, information from the literature. We looked at individuals that had biophysical determination of a loss or gain of function. And then we divided them into two, a truth set. We eliminated individuals that had variants of other, uh, at other um, genes that could be involved in epilepsy. We made a very strict truth set and then we built a predictive model and what the model was showing you, I can't make it go back again, I guess, could I go backwards and then forwards, you could see it spin, that it is um, a fairly distinct set of individuals grouped into orange gain of function and blue loss of function. And the major features that distinguish those groups are shown on the right. So now that we can sort of go and uh, make a classification that puts gain of individuals gain of function and loss of function in separate categories for the most part, can we now focus on just gain of function? I'm going to deal with loss of function at some other time, but for now I just want to focus on gain of function, which is the majority of individuals. So based on 271 individuals, um, a very, a very important aspects of the outcome um, have to do with seizure freedom, obviously, and, and developmental quotient. Developmental quotient is a statistic that summarizes how many developmental skills uh, individuals acquire relative to neurotypical individuals. And you can see that seizure freedom and uh, the higher developmental quotients are associated with aged onset. So aged onset predicts more earlier, earlier age of onset predicts less seizure freedom. And when I say seizure freedom, I mean tendency to not have seizures. We ask whether uh, individuals had a seizure in the last six months. Most individuals that have had no seizures in the last six months, even if there's an occasional breakthrough, tend to be more seizure free than other individuals who have daily, monthly seizures. And so also the developmental quotient of those with um, a higher developmental quotient also tend to be the individuals that are seizure free. So now I want to turn and look more specifically at what the effect of particular variants are. So this is the question of what does it mean for my child to have a particular variant? And so what I'm going to talk about are genotype-phenotype correlations, and we now have enough data that we can actually look at individuals with a recurrent variant like 850 or 1475 or 1617Q shown on the, on the, on the topology of the, of the channel. And you can see we have 1872, we have 1877, and um, a region called D3S45 that interacts as part of the fast inactivation. And so we've looked at these seven different regions and we've got somewhere between 10 and 20 individuals with a, a variant and then we can ask questions like, do these correlate with any particular outcomes? And so what you're seeing here is the age of onset, again, correlates with severity of outcome in the sense that you see on the upper left the age of onset and the percent of seizure freedom reported. And you can see that each variant kind of falls on a relatively straight line uh, that statistically, there's a statistical correlation there, so that those in the lower left, like 850 and 1872W, tend to be less seizure-free, and those in the upper right, like 1877 and 1475, tend to have more seizure freedom, and they have a later onset. So 
That's very interesting to see a correlation like that because it indicates that there are genotype-phenotype correlations in, in particular, which has not been seen in the literature because you need enough data to accumulate a cohort of significant sample size to do these statistics. The other things that we've seen on the lower left, age and onset also correlates with developmental quotient as we, we showed before, but now you can see for each individual variant that holds true. In the upper right, what's interesting is there's a negative correlation between age and onset and the number of drugs that have been tried and weaned, as well as the number of current drugs. So the orange dots indicate drugs that have been weaned, and the later the onset, the, the fewer drugs have been weaned and fewer drugs that are currently maintained. And you can see that even more clearly on the bar chart in the lower right. You can see that the variants on the left side, the W, the 850, the D3S45, are a little bit more severe. And there you can see the weaned drug shown in the red bar and the current drug shown in the, the number of current drugs shown in the blue. And so there's very interesting uh, patterns of correlation here that need to be further investigated. And finally, um, we've done some work trying to um, do some predictive modeling where we take clinical features and not just divide into categories as loss or gain of function, but there are different categories of gain of function. So we've been able to show statistically that there are three groups, mild, moderate, and severe DEE. So there's mild gain of function, moderate DEE, and severe, over 50 percent of the population has got the severe category, about 20 percent are loss of function. And you can see associated with each variant, there is a gradient so that the more severe variants tend to have more severe outcomes, and the milder variants, like 1877, have uh, more mild and moderate outcomes. So there's a correlation between a particular variant and a particular outcome in our modeling. And this is very interesting. I don't think we've seen this before, that you can actually distinguish 1872. There's an amino acid, tryptophan and glutamine, and we have roughly equal numbers of patients with W and Q. That's the single letter amino acid for those amino acids. And you can see that 1872W is more severe. And what you notice right away is 37% of those have an onset in the neonatal period, the first month of life, which is a very... Um, difficult thing for, for an individual to suffer seizures at that er, at, at early of age. And you can see that only 5% report seizure freedom and 76 um, have delays. And whereas the 1870QQ, there are no needle onset uh, individuals in our database with a median age of onset of four versus one for, that's months, uh, for the Q and W. And they have a higher reporting rate of seizure freedom and, um, and, and less developmental delay. There are, um, now we, the next thing we wanted to look at was, are there age-associated patterns? And there team, seems to be, this is, we're, we're taking individuals that are current, uh, went at age of inclusion, they were either less than five or more than 10 years old, and, we divide, and then we look at these features in those specific age stratification groups. And you can see the number of seizure type goes up from less than five-year-old to more than 10-year-old, with five to 10-year-olds in the middle, and then developmentally delayed, uh, the number of people reporting that goes up with age, and the number of weaned uh, med ASMs also goes up from five, less than five to more than 10 years old. And so the question then is, is that a natural progression of the disease, or are there un hidden sort of variables that are confounding the data? And I think one of the most important things is that the gap between the onset age and the time you're diagnosed, the older kids have a much longer gap in that onset diagnosis uh, gap. And so I think that's gonna play an important role, and we did some statistical testing there. You can see the, the gap uh, increasing with the different age groups on the le upper left, a much longer gap for individuals that are older than 10, and a shorter gap for individuals reporting seizure freedom, and a longer gap correlates with increasing number of seizure types. So in sum, the increasing gap leads to a larger number of seizure types and a less seizure freedom. So I think that if we're going to do uh, some age structured analysis, we're gonna need to filter this out to control for that confounding variable. And we'll have to look more closely at individual uh, longitudinal data to really tease apart some of the processes that are going on with the progression of this disease. 
And last thing is something about drugs. So there are uh, about 14% of our population is on one drug, which is really interesting that we can sort of see what's going on without the confound of a cocktail. And you can notice that the sodium channel blockers certainly dominate in terms of the drugs that those people taking a single medicine um, are taking. You see oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin, and, and lacosamide are uh, the most uh, prevalently uh, taken as a monotherapy. And then clobazam kind of pokes up a little bit there too. Um, and then if you add a, look at those on a dual therapy, and on the right, you can see the red bars indicate a, two people, uh, pe uh, individuals on two drugs, and you can see valproate really stands out as a drug that is in, in commonly used in addition to a sodium channel blocker, not quite as often as a second sodium channel blocker is used with, a, uh, with so there are two sodium channel blockers or a sodium channel blocker and valproate. I don't know if that's going to point to some kind of guidance in terms of what kinds of uh, uh, guidelines we might uh, consider, but that's at least a hint that there might be something important about looking at drug combinations. So just to, uh, to end, uh, tell you what I've told you, predictive modeling classifies patients to loss and gain-of-function groups, and progress is being made toward the subdividing gain-of-function patients into distinct severity subgroups. Different SCNA variants are associated with milder or more severe outcomes. Uh, patients with milder variants have later uh, age and onset, tend to have higher rates of seizure freedom and higher developmental quotient, and require fewer drugs to manage their seizures. Uh, Genotype-phenotype correlations offer opportunities to investigate uh, cause and effect relationships and precision medicine approaches to treatment. And patterns of disease progression offer a baseline for a comparison of outcomes in clinical trials. Um, and I want to stress that while your data from all these families that's been contributed to the registry has made us get to the point where we are now. We do need uh, continuing participation, especially for those families that have participated multiple times so we can get a longitudinal picture of what's changing with the, your child's age. So I just wanted to thank the, the research team that we have a wonderful team at the University of Arizona and internationally, um, and as well as Dr. Schreiber in Washington and our international SCA Alliance partners and uh, wonderful family members like uh, Tyler Youngquist, who's a scientist, has contributed a lot, and other families who are contributing and helping us organize our uh, groups. Uh, we have network group meetings, and Combined Brain contributed also to the work that we're doing. So once again, thank you families for everything you've done to power this uh, project from uh, zero to a hundred in, in 10 years. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you and we still need you to participate. Um, join our network meetings. There's uh, a list of all the meetings we have on the Alliance webpage. Um, for any family who wants to join any meeting, we have them weekly and we talk about the science and families connect. And uh, we've done it geographically, now we're kind of do it by language and we'll actually do it internationally as well. And uh, get involved with this research. Go to scnatic.net and, and click the button, get involved with the research, and become part of our registry team uh, and contribute your data, be part of, part of the progress that we're making. Thank you very much. I have time for one question. I'll actually ask a quick question while I'm walking around and looking for hands. Um, but uh, first, I, I think the point you made at the very end, that you need longitudinal data to see how things change over time really is key. One of the data points I like that you showed was that our, the, the diagnostic odyssey is that time has decreased. Now we have much less latency to diagnose, presumably because now this, this gene is on so many different panels. And it seems like that may translate to more seizure freedom and better outcomes. I mean, do you get the sense that, are, are you seeing that in the data? Is that something you can investigate now? And would more longitudinal data help you with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the younger folks, the younger uh, people under five um, uh, are doing better. But then again, do we know, if the natural course of the disease continues, will they tend to do a little bit worse as they get older? We don't know because the older ones have this problem of this onset diagnosis gap that's much larger. So it's going to come down to not statistics of the population, but individual trajectories that we're going to have to look at lined up with each other and see what kinds of patterns emerge. It's still going to be difficult because, um, you know, 
there is uh, there are unequal ground on, on, on the, what the patients are experiencing environmentally and the drug cocktails. But once we have guidance, as we go in the future, this should be easier to sort out. Um, <clears throat> for your, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hammer. This research is really inspirational. And I know you said one question, but I hope I can uh, do two quick questions. And the first one is in terms of confound, confounding effects and the drug treatments. I, I would imagine that there might be some bias there from the clinicians to use one drug versus the other that we cannot control. So unless there was a random pool of drugs being tested, I, I don't know. That's the first one. And the second one is in terms of the data that you, that you collect, are you, are you looking to collect more like, um, how to describe this, like hard data, like measurements? Cause because we have like several different readings uh, from several different parents, so they, they might be not as comparable as data. Yes. Like. No, I, hear, I see where you're going with that. So the first point is, uh, I didn't have a chance to show, but some drugs seem to be preferred earlier in the earlier age groups, the younger age groups, versus the older age groups. Oxcarb is used less in the older groups, and lamotrigine is used more. And that, you know, what that means, I don't know, but there are differences in drug usage. Now, does that mean that the older, that the clinicians were presenting, uh, you know, had their choice of a drug, their preference for a drug, and that was being offered because of that reason, or was it because it was uh, something was tried and failed and then found to be working? We don't know the answer to that. Maybe our next speaker will be able to address some of those kinds of more difficult questions, especially on their second point, because we need to combine parent-reported data with medical records and medical tests and things. And I think Elena, our next speaker, will be able to speak to some of those issues, as uh, her project does involve more uh, medical. We have the opportunity to, uh, to work with the citizen data to combine medical records with our registry data, which is something we hope we'll be doing in the next year or so. We have one question in the chat. Um, could you explain why later onset leads to less weaned ASMs? As later onset has been linked with less severe DEE, I would think that more ASMs are weaned. If this is due to fewer ASMs initially tried, maybe a ratio of ASM initiated versus ASM weaned would be more revealing. Well, that's an excellent question. I think it's that you don't need to try and fail so many drugs. So if you try, if you know, again, if you got to start with something that makes sense, and if um, and if it works, and, and you have a milder case, then maybe you'll be less likely to wean. But maybe some other kind of ratio like that would be worth looking into. That's a very very interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And next we have Dr. Elena Gardella. She's here from the Danish Epilepsy Center. Uh, we're, it's always such a pleasure to have her here every year. She is presenting new and exciting data. Uh, she and her group really does just an, an excellent job of phenotyping uh, both the clinical characteristics, the neurophysiology, and just gives a great sense of what SCN 8A looks like in the clinic and how that can inform our diagnosis and treatment. So Dr. Gardella, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Casey and Hilary, and thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure being there, as usual. And I'm so happy. This time, I would like to talk to you a little bit about, um, I mean, the details of our uh, further research in the phenotyping, and especially in the loss of function. And I, it's nice that I, I mean, uh, I, I will follow what, what uh, Michael, Michael showed about the loss of function. It is incredible how different approach can lead to similar perspectives. So that means we are on the right side. Now, for the ones who do not know me that much, I'm, I'm a full 100% a clinician, so my point of view will be the clinical one. I'm the fortune to work with a strong, I mean, genetic group, so actually I'm pretty much biased and genetically oriented, but then show you the clinical details. And we work pretty much with the families, so all the details that we get are is due to that, I mean, close contact with them and to gathering, I mean, really the precious difference that makes make this, the story much, pretty much clear. Uh, sorry, I have to move. Whoop. Yeah, uh, so I do not have any conflict. So I will start briefly showing that we know that it is a spectrum. And we know that from the very beginning that the spectrum range from the very severe 
to the very, very mild. And we know that there is a, an area in between a, a group of, of uh, children, say, of subjects, that there are something which is hybrid in between. And part of this uh, heterogeneity is due to the different uh, functional effect of the variant, Gulf versus Lofman. This is not all of the story. But um, in any case, we started clustering this patient and I'm pretty much focused on clustering, making it subgroup of phenotype. This is very important for the very beginning because if you get your child in a group with, of of uh, subjects which share the same feature is the likelihood that you can um, draw a trajectory which is realistic and for predicting uh, the, the outcome and for the treatment is much higher. So if you mix up uh, a person with different phenotype in the same group, I think it comes a blending of information which is not clear for a clinician. It can result in pretty much confusing. We start in any case dividing at least the first three phenotype the very benign, which is, we know, is a mild golf. The very severe is a severe golf. And in between, the intermediate, which is a mix of golf and love. And we, we need to focus clinically on that because they are difficult to distinguish. We know how much important it is to be able to, to go back, since as Michael said, it, we do not have the possibility to test any single variant. So to go back from the, our knowledge, and especially from my point of view, from our clinics, sitting in front of your patient, being able to predict what is the likelihood that this is a loss, really. So I have to, to, to build up a totally different strategy and to counsel in a totally different way. So we focus on this intermediate phenotype, sorry, back. And, uh, and um, for our, yes. Uh, last, uh, latest paper, in any case, wouldn't be the last one, but in any case, latest paper, we understood that it was a little bit more heterogeneous than expected, including different phenotypes. I'll go back to that. In any case, what we saw from uh, that there are uh, difference, uh, roughly difference, and especially the major difference was in the, the law phenotype, of course, as a great major, I mean, a great part of, uh, a big part of, of subjects which do not suffer from epilepsy, but the one as, as epilepsy is a different kind of epilepsy. And very quickly, I go back to that. And of course, the treatment is different. It's obvious that uh, sodium channel blockers are most effective on the gain of function, but the loss of function has some peculiar reaction, and some of them also respond to a combination on sodium channel blocker and sodium channel blockers. But in any case, the, the, the response is so different that it motivates even more to go for a deeper um, in characterization. And this is why we had a fellow, uh, a fellowship on that this year, and this Roberto is our fellow from Italy. He worked nine months on the subclassification of the loss of function phenotype. So we asked us, could we really do more? Can we predict exactly uh, if, if a child has a, has a loss when we see in, the, in our outpatient clinic? So our, uh, I mean, Preconcept, our knowledge said that, that the GOF are made of a severe development epileptic encephalopathy is a phenotype, a very benign, the benign family epilepsy, and an intermediate phenotype that can be worn. While the loss of function, as we know, are due to mainly neurodevelopmental disorder, no epilepsy, so we're almost sure that they are loss of function, we see a, a patient like that. A generalized epilepsy, the generalized epilepsy is only, was only seen in the loss of function group, so if you see these two groups, I mean, the, the, the possibility there is a loss is very, very high, and an intermediate. So you see intermediate is in both group. This is probably the phenotype you have to focus most to be able to distinguish further. So we started from our database. The database is now is almost 700 um, um, patient included, so which is quite broad. So we start excluding all the patient, what we knew, uh, we, we know for, for sure that they are gain, gain of function effect. And so we, we also uh, uh, selected the one with uh, for sure a loss of function effect. And so we also, we, we try to, to gather more patient, which is one we do not know the effect of the variant for sure, uh, selecting them because uh, by an, I mean, a combination of clinical information and prediction tool that was in collaboration with Professor Lal here, uh, which was a great, I mean, um, tools for the, the prediction of the functional effect. And in case of doubt, we, we moved to, to the functional analysis of the variants. So 
In this way, we, we were able to, to collect, uh, this is uh, some result from the functional analysis, we were able in any case to collect a relatively large cohort of uh, children and young adults having uh, um, almost sure or 100% or sure loss of function effect. And what was, uh, was surprising, I mean, you see the median age was 10 years, so they are quite young, but up to 42 years. So actually, we could also see some long-term evolution of the disease. And, um, and you see, what is very important that uh, beside the, the clinical result, which is the, the speech issues, the taxi and the hypotonia is the most prominent clinical manifestation, uh, uh, we also uh, were able to, to, to show that the trajectory of their autonomy. Would not, we didn't focus only on epilepsy, but we focused also pretty much on the performance and the other symptoms which sometimes are neglected. And what we can see for sure, you see the trajectories are uh, not um, linear, but what is clear cut is even the, the, this, the majority of this subject has got some, uh, I mean, um, needs, needs some assistance, we didn't find any regression or negative evolution of the symptoms. A sort of follow-up, this is a fall uh, between a, a, a school age, we do not know why, because this do not correlate with the epilepsy. So this is to be a trend which is independent from the epilepsy course, but in any case, what is important is encouraging for us, we do not, uh, we, there is no, seems not to be uh, um, a negative trend, uh, a regression, or even a stagnation of the capability, which is good. Regarding the epilepsy, I told you, uh, we have different phenotype. The, the, the generalized epilepsy is just for the love, so this is quite sure. Uh, a, a myoclonic epilepsy, which is mainly, mainly represented in the law phenotype, so this is also a peculiar phenotype. No epilepsy, I will say, uh, is, is a law phenotype. And we also surprising also the DE, actually, which reminds pretty much the one which you know pretty nice for the GOF. This is the tricky group, because this is difficult to, to discriminate from, from the, the, the phenotype of the GOF. You see what this is very important, also this subclassification, because we talked pretty much about the age at onset. The age at onset is important. Of course, the LOF has a later age at onset of epilepsy, but this is specifically true, peculiarly true, if you subdivide the LOF in phenotype. Because if you consider the phenotype with generalized epilepsy, they are definitely a later age at onset. And if you combine this later edge of onset with an electroclinical picture of generalized epilepsy, you are more than 90% sure that this is a loss of function. But if you see the DE phenotype related to loss of function as an age of onset, this is mean age of onset is 14 months. It's not the four months for gain of function, but it's pretty low. And in any case, you have some subject as an age of onset at one month of age. So that means that overlap pretty much with a severe phenotype. So you, you do not have to rely strictly on the age at onset, but combining the age at onset with the other clinical information, and especially remember to subdivide in phenotype, because otherwise the, mean, the, the meaning of the single um, clinical uh, um, topic is very, very, becomes low. Uh, you see also regarding the, the, the disease duration, you see, many in the different phenotypes still have ongoing seizure. What we saw that the generalized phenotype tends to remit more than the other phenotypes. So if you combine generalized phenotype, later age at onset, I mean, not that much treatable because still uh, many patients have seizure when, when, while treated, but tends to remit over time more than the other ones. And what uh, we saw this is the seizure type, of course, which is also important. Absences, seizure are represented through, through the, the, all the phenotype, but pretty much the more in the generalized uh, phenotype. And the myoclonic seizure are the, mm, I mean, principal uh, phenotype of the subgroup with myoclonic epilepsy. So we are a subgroup of SGNAD with a loss of function, with a only or primarily myoclonic seizure or secondary myoclonic to bilateral tonic clonic seizure. So these two phenotypes, I mean, they generalize with mainly absences of tonic clonic seizure. The myoclonic with just myoclonic seizure are clear cut distinguishable and there are different trajectories and also different response to the treatment. 
So this is also which also this is something which helps us pretty much in the clinics because if you recognize that phenotype and this is reminds you to the group that you know pretty nicely, I, I mean you can direct your treatment approach in a very tailored way, and then also uh, I mean anticipate some some uh, uh, problem or prevent some problems that you, you can find in, in the management of these children, which are different. I mean, they're all of them are love, but the generalized and the myoclonic are totally different in the trajectories. Also, the EG point of view is, is important. I won't spend too much time on that because I'm a little bit obsessed with EG, but I just to show you that EG is different from the one we described in a golf phenotype, which is, is an peculiar. I described something which is very a fingerprint, but it's just for the golf. The love are different, and this, the different subgroups share some um, similar features, which also, I mean, helps or, I mean, support our suspicion of love. If you look at EG, and regarding the cognition, you see uh, also pretty much heterogeneous, still. 20% uh, of, of uh, subjects of children which has a severe intellectual disability, but the large majority has a moderate, to mild to moderate. And this mild to moderate do not, I mean, uh, uh, works over time. And you see, again, a pretty, a consistent difference in the generalized epilepsy phenotype with respect, for example, to the DE. They are totally different in terms of cognition. This is also by definition, but it's a generalized phenotype as in the one we know epilepsy and much better performance over time than the other two phenotypes related to loss, as genetic effect. So what we, we, we learned from that is that the GOF definitely, when we see a benign familial infantile epilepsy, this is a GOF for sure, so far, yeah. When for the LOF, I mean, the neurodevelopmental disorder without epilepsy is a LOF almost for sure, so far. Generalized epilepsy is a love. Myoclonic epilepsy is likely a love. Still, some trouble with the DE, the severe and the uh, moderate DE, which might be both. And uh, we also have some clinical probably run, running out of time if I come into the, detail, the details, but uh, due to our deep phenotyping we love, I mean, squeezing details, we also find some slight difference between de love and de golf, which I, I think we, we, can, we can do more than that, but now we are confident to be able to, at least to suspect a love for a DEUA. This is fundamental also for the, the treatment for a therapeutic approach, and now we are coming up many uh, tailored selective sodium channel blockers, which you, you have to avoid in the loss of function. And these DE are tricky. It's very important to recognize them. So we will put even more effort in this direction because we need, we need to, 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 be, to become better and better. But now what we see, the DE love is, is milder. There are some peculiar features we can distinguish from, from the DE GOF. I will come with more details next time. And, uh, and the very last, I mean, uh, surprise, which is something which Christian Bosseman is going to describe now, is published, in, is, uh, yeah, is finalizing the paper right now. The love, we are a new phenotype for the love, this is a paroxysmal ataxia, which was, has been described for uh, the, the SGN2A, for example, for allergies, but not for SGNAD. So this is another phenotype which is uh, distinguishable, uh, peculiar, and this is a LOF only, exclusive a LOF phenotype. But this is uh, will be will be an important, I mean, uh, add to, to to our knowledge, and uh, yeah, and I just uh, move to the final conclusion. You know, four LOF subgroups distinguishable with different prevalence in our cohort, which is large enough in any case. And uh, out of 700 patients, I think we can say something. In any case, uh, if we, we, we become better and better in sub-classifying the loss of function, will be, I mean, a great advantage also for the treatment uh, prognosis. And I will just finish mentioning the, the SGN8 portal that uh, Dennis Love built up and we contribute, our group contributed somehow because it's very, it's very, very, I mean, important and it's a great help also for researchers as also for family. I invite you to go there. And the very last thing, uh, this is an error, of course, is to, to 2023. We, uh, we added the, the first uh, family gathering and uh, researcher gathering meeting last year. We are going to have the second one in Denmark, and uh, it was a great experience. Many of you were there, 
and um, and I hope to see you to see some of you there and and meeting again. It was very fruitful from the scientific and human point of view. And um, I do thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the collaborators. Thank you, especially all the family and the family association, because without this collaboration, we won't be able to, to, to be here and for telling you about what we knew. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. I think it's on. Okay, there we go. Uh, I have one question while we're waiting for questions to come in. Um, so, is there something distinct then about the law? Of that has a DE phenotype? Is, are they different in terms of genotype? Are they, can you tell any difference between protein truncating variants versus missense? Are there splice sites variants? Anything else yeah. about them that you can yeah. tell them apart? No, no, and actually, in, in not clear cut. It's from the genetic point of view, it's not different. What, what our fellow found out is a critical point, in any case, where the, uh, across the, yeah, some of the DE false, I mean, but if you, if you ask whether it is uh, truncating versus missus, it was not the case. But there was like a locus that was... Yeah, yeah. likely. I mean, okay. Okay. It's, it's weak, but I mean, it's a weak sign, but it's something yeah. which we can use, we can use yeah. in the future too. Neat, okay. Thanks. Any other, uh, maybe time for one more question? Yeah. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about variants that don't cleanly fit into one category or another. So a variant that has some loss of function properties, some gain of function properties. How are you taking that into account? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is why I start from the clinic. <laughs> no, but this is a good question. And I think um, now you remember, I start from the clinic and it was with purpose, first of all, because I'm a clinician, but also because once you select patient because of the phenotype, you are, uh, you are a group of, of persons that have the same trajectory. And so no matter what is in the box, in the genetic box, you know that this trend is like that. And you can use it in the clinics, it's, it's much closer. I know that the genetics is complicated. We, we have in our experience several variants which are both a mixed Goff and Love effect and several degrees on Goffalov. So this is difficult to interpret it. I mean, the results, you can interpret the result, but not the result. So uh, actually, I believe that a big part of the heterogeneity that we have in intermediate space will be due to this complicated genetic background. And we will talk also to, 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 also to do other variants that can be uh, associated as chain AD. So actually, it's, it's not, it's not my, my job, that. I think I do not use that. I think we have to, to work with the mass genetic more. But independently on the genetic background, if you have a phenotype which fits in a group, you can, in any case, uh, compare with the other member of the group and predict the trajectory and predict the effect of the clinics. And this is why I would like to contribute pretty much to the clinic, because we, we forget that we, we have also I mean, uh, other instrument to be combined with the genetic to, to, to tailor our approach, both, I mean, counseling and therapeutic approach to, to, our, to our patient, which is important. Thank you so much. Okay, and lastly, I'm told that if I click the slides here, this is going to work. So um, uh, we have uh, joining us from China, uh, Dr. Hu, who actually had the pleasure of meeting on our uh, consensus panel. Um, and uh, he's going to speak today about the phenotypic and genetic spectrum in Chinese children with SCN 8A related disorders. Uh, they really have a, a wealth of information there and have done a tremendous job in uh, performing this work. So if I click on this, it should start the video. One more time. Hello, everyone. I'm Chun Hui Hu. My tutor is Yvonne Professor. My partner is Dr. Tian Mo. Today, my topic is phenotypic and genetic spectrum in Chinese children with SNA-related disorders. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions. I think 80 gene mutations rank third in genetic epilepsy. And I think 80 gene mutations in children have been reported with a wide spectrum of phenotypes, ranging from ICRIG 
intermediate to epilepsy, DE, generalized epilepsy, unclassified epilepsy, a neurodevelopmental disorder without epilepsy. Functional studies have revealed that pathogenic mistense variations can lead to SAI and DG mainly through gain law function. Both loss of function and gain of function have been associated with neurodevelopmental disorders without seizures. In China Hospital, 50 patients diagnosed with SNA related disorders from June 2013 to June 2020 were included in the respective study. Pernit brain injury, metabolic disease, intrauterine infection, obvious brain structure malformation were included in this study. Severe D was defined as where there is developmental impairment with frequent epileptic activity. The intermediate epilepsy were referred to as developmental encephalopathy with epilepsy and seizure frequency was less than four times per month. SLIG were characterized self-limiting infertile epilepsy with no other neurological deficits. We found 50 patients, 70% was severe DEG, 12% was SELIG, 16% was developmental encephalopathy with epilepsy, 2% was severe developmental disease without epilepsy. The seizure onset age ranged from 1 day to 1 year and 11 months. Same out of 35 patients with severe DEG development West syndrome. For the severe DEG phenotype, among 35 patients with severe DEG, the onset age of seizures were from 1 day to 12 months. There were various seizure types. 20 patients showed the most common epileptic syndrome, West syndrome, after any seizure treatment. 28 patients, their seizure on control. Sodium channel blockers appear to be effective in line patients. For the SELIE phenotype, 6 patients were diagnosed with SELIE onset age ranging from 10 days to 6 months. All patients were tested with normal development of intelligence. 5 patients were found had to have normal EG signals on one patient show small spike waves in the left temporal lobe. After early period, the patient's EG turned normal electrical activity. Oscopaspin was found to be affecting all patients. For the developmental encephalopathy with epilepsy, six patients were taken with intermediate epilepsy. Sodium chain blockers were were found to be effective in some patients. Only one patient were diagnosed with severe developmental delay without epilepsy. It has a de novo head rises missense mutation, which has been reported as pathogenic variant. A variety of rehabilitation training did not promote the intelligence development of the boy. His development assessed. For the phenotype and the genotype correlation, five patients' variants were defined as de novo missions with exception of one spice set variant, with summarized recurrent variations and genotype phenotype association. No association was found between mutation, location, and the phenotype. So in this study, in China, we reported the phenotypic spectrum of SNA-related disorders ranging from severe developmental disease without epilepsy to severe DEG. Although sodium channel blockers were effective for treating seizures in some SNA-related disorders, its effect may have no significant correlation with the mutant location. The reason why the same variant location in various phenotypes first is 
gene expression networks theory, the single gene abnormality can be considered as preparation to gene expression. The emergent clinical phenotypes are a function of the interactions between multiple abnormally expressed genes rather than any specific gene. The second is morcesium and modified gene. Third is genetic interaction between SNAT and potassium channel. Even synonymous mutations are non-neutral, overturns more than half-century assumption. In the past years, SNA-related disorders have passed more than 25 years, from the first new variation discovery to SOS therapy and gene therapy. Generally, therapeutic discovery for epileptic encephalopathy through IPSC technology is emerging. We are entering the modern era of gene therapy, such as gene addition, gene expression modification, gene supplementation. There are lots of things to do in the future, and we are looking forward to cooperate in the global. Thank you. John, do you have any closing remarks at all? Or do you have any other questions or anything you want to do before we move on? No? OK, perfect. All right, well, I would like to introduce Dr. Svetlana Shore, Director of Clinical Development at Neurocrine Biosciences, presenting Neurocrine Biosciences Research Updates. Thank you. Hello, my name is Svetlana Shore. I'm the Clinical Development Director of Neurocrine's Epilepsy Program, and I believe I am standing in between you and your dinner, so I will be quick. Okay. I'm going to start with just one quick slide introducing Neurocrine, and then I will hop right into the investigational product that we are developing for SCN8ADEE. It's called NBI921352 and then the study that will be evaluating its efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics called the KAYAK study. So first, just one slide about Neurocrine. We are a neuroscience-focused biopharmaceutical company. We are located in San Diego. Please come visit, it's very nice. Uh, we, have a, we have a big chunk of our epilepsy group sitting in the back there. If anyone wants to come say hi after, during dinner, um, we are under the neurology franchise, but we also have a neuroendocrinology and a neuropsychiatry franchise as well. Our focus is on debilitating diseases and disorders, and we're very passionate about being in this space and, and grateful to be with you guys here today working on this. We created a video earlier this year that uh, to teach people about what SCN 8A is and also why how NBI 921352 works and, and why we believe that this is a, a, a product that should be developed for SCN 8A DEE. You all know all about SCN 8A, but um, the 352 part is kind of cool, so we thought we'd show it. It's quick. Nerve cells, or neurons, constantly work to maintain an electrical charge on their surface by pumping ions out of the cell, creating a polarized state, meaning there's a different charge on the outside versus the inside of the cell. Neuron impulses, called action potentials, take place when an electrical impulse causes voltage-activated sodium or calcium channels to open, depolarizing the membrane. These voltage-gated ion channels are critical to the propagation of action potentials and therefore are an important target for the development of therapeutics that modulate overactive signaling in the brain. The wave of depolarization travels down the axon to its terminus, where it triggers the release of neurotransmitters, which enable neurons to communicate with one another. Dysfunction in voltage-gated channels can cause serious malfunction, leading to hyperexcitability in these nerve channels responsible for several forms of epilepsy, movement disorders, and pain syndromes. 
SCN8A, Developmental and Epileptic Encephalopathy, is a rare, severe pediatric syndrome linked to mutations in the NAV1.6 sodium channel that make brain cells more excitable, thus lowering the triggering threshold for seizures. Patients with SCN8A DEE experience severe epilepsy with seizures beginning around four months of age. These seizures are highly variable, often occurring multiple times a day. Patients also experience early onset developmental delay, cognitive impairment, and decline with greater than 90% unable to speak and motor abnormalities with about 50% of patients unable to walk. This condition is rare, with less than 1,000 patients estimated to be diagnosed with the disorder worldwide. Up to 10% of these children may die from sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP. While genetic testing is available, it is still not widely used. There are no currently approved therapies for SCN8A DEE, and seizures associated with this syndrome are highly resistant to currently available anti-seizure medications. NBI-921352 is an investigational compound that may offer a precise therapeutic approach to treat SCN8A DEE. Due to mutations in the SCN8A gene, the NAV1.6 channel has a near constant flow of sodium ions. This increases neuron activation, resulting in the disorder. NBI-921352 inhibits NAV1.6 function, potentially reducing the excitability of brain cells. NBI-921352 is being investigated as a precision medicine approach to specifically inhibit NAV1.6 dysfunction as a potential treatment for the symptoms of SCNA8A DEE. Neurocrine Biosciences is currently conducting a phase two study of NBI-921352 as an adjunctive therapy in children and young adults living with SCNA8A DEE. So the idea is SCN8A is the gene that codes for the NAV1.6 sodium channel subtype. If you have a gain of function mutation at SCN8A and a hyperfunctioning NAV1.6 channel, uh, NBI91352 can counteract that uh, as an inhibitor selectively for that exact subtype. Okay. So the, the CAIAC study is the study that will be evaluating the efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics of NBI-921352, and we wanted to you know, put a plug here for a thank you for the Acute Syndrome Foundation and all the families that are contributing their time to our trial. We, we literally couldn't do it without you, so thank you to everyone that's helped us this, thus far. So I'll tell you a little bit about the study in case you or someone you know may be interested. Uh, the key eligibility criteria is two to 21 years of age, uh, obviously have SCN 8A DEE. Uh, there are certain criteria, I'll, I'll save this for the, I have another slide on this, um, I'll, say, I'll talk about it then. The, the, the participants do need to be refractory Two ASMs have at least one countable motor seizure per week on average and not be seizure free for more than 20 consecutive days. Uh, the, the trial is an adjunctive therapy trial, so you must currently be receiving treatment with at least one other anti seizure medication, but no more than four. And as I mentioned, must be refractory, uh, which means fail to achieve seizure freedom with at least two previously tried ASMs. Uh, to be clear, this is a, a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So uh, if, if a child meets the entry criteria, they will be randomized, so 50-50 chance to either the study drug NBI-921352 or placebo. Um, there are a number of, of pretty standard assessments and exams and evaluations that occur during the treatment, um, and, and we do offer compensation for, for the time and travel uh, and you know, the burden that, that is undertaken by being a part of our trial. 
Okay, so just a little bit about the inclusion criteria around the diagnostic parameters. We have both clinical and genetic uh, findings that are that are required to enter the trial. Uh, both of them support a SAN 8A DEE diagnosis. So the clinical findings is an early seizure onset, specifically before 18 months of age, and developmental delay can be before, during, or after the seizures began. Uh, the genetic findings in the protocol currently require a gain of function mutation, uh, cannot be a loss of function mutation, and also no other pathogenic mutation in a different gene that might explain better the epilepsy that's being experienced by the subject. Uh, we do realize that for the SAN 8 ADEE patients, you have already received genetic testing. Uh, it will be done again as part of this trial. This is the study design. Uh, on the top is the timeline. As I mentioned, there's a screening period where eligibility will be reviewed and a seizure diary will be kept. Uh, and then if if your child is eligible, then they will undergo randomization where it's flip of a coin, 50-50 chance, either active treatment or placebo. Uh, it'll be a six-week titration period where the dose will be up titrated in a stepwise manner until the highest tolerated dose for, for the weight group will be reached. After six weeks, uh, then your child will enter the maintenance period, which is 10 weeks, and the dose will not be changed at that point. At the end of the maintenance period, there is a choice. We do have an uh, open label extension peer, uh, study that they can move into, uh, or if, if that's not of interest, then there's a two-week taper period and then a four-week safety follow-up period, which is post-treatment. The goal of this study, the question that we're asking is, is about seizure frequency. So you'll have a seizure diary that's kept during screening and then all throughout the trial. And we will ask the question, does NBI 921352 uh, reduce the seizure frequency from baseline relative to placebo? So that's the most important endpoint that, that we're collecting. But we're also collecting some scale data, the CGI, the PGI. These are Likert scales, you know, on a on a, a scale from one to seven, what is the improvement? What is the severity? Uh, to also get some non-seizure endpoints to support the da the, the data. This I left the stu study timeline at the top of this slide, but at the bottom you will see that the protocol includes two separate cohorts. The Sentinel cohort is just the first eight people that are randomized into the trial, and I'm happy to report that we have enrolled the Sentinel co cohort Excuse me, recently. We have eight subjects, eight children in the trial, and that was a big milestone for us, so it's an end and all the people that have helped us along the way. So the Sentinel cohort is reviewed, um, excuse me, is enrolled and will be reviewed by an independent data monitoring committee, or DMC. They will review the safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetic data. And if if everything is, is as expected, then we will open the main cohort. So this is a graphical representation of, of what I just described. We have the eight patients that were enrolled into the Sentinel cohort that happened here in the United States. And, and then the data will be passed to the Independent Data Monitoring Committee. And once they've had a chance to look at it, and if all is well, we will open the main cohort, which will be a global, global cohort up to, with a total of up to 52 patients for the entire trial. Uh, the plan is to, if, if all goes well, the plan is to open that cohort next year. So thank you for having me and letting me share our investigational product and our study design. Uh, thank you. I'll let you enjoy your dinner. Um, just just one, one quick thing before I get off the stage. Uh, if, if you're interested or you know anyone's interested, anyone else in the community, um, that's, that's what we need help with. Uh, we realize it is a burden to have to travel and be a part of the trial, but we, we would like to work with you on that as much as possible and um, get this trial enrolled and evaluate this drug. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much. What an incredible uh, announcement that we got to make tonight that the Sentinel cohort is filled. So very exciting. All right. I know we said dinner. I have one more thing <laughs> before we go to dinner. It's short, I promise. But I do want to plug that we have a virtual silent auction fundraiser going on right now. Uh, Hillary and I just talked about how we were able to fund 19 families to come today and enjoy this wonderful weekend. And so we do have that fundraiser going on so we can continue that next year. And so I actually, we have um, a SCNAA sibling, Trinity Young, and she is getting ready to tell us a little bit about that silent auction. She was the driving force behind the idea of this. And she approached me and said, I really want to do something, but I don't really know what to do or how to pull it off. And so we chatted and she said, what about a silent auction? And I pulled in one of our volunteers, Daniel Hayward, and said, hey, can you make this happen? She said, yeah, I think we can. And so that's where we're at today. We do have a QR code on the table tents that you guys can scan. It will take you to our website, follow the prompts to the virtual silent auction, and it will be open until two o'clock tomorrow. Once her video is over, feel free to go ahead and get up and grab dinner, and then we will have a PowerPoint that will circle through throughout dinner with some TCSF updates. We'll reconvene in about 30 minutes, and we'll get started. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Cute Syndrome Foundation's first silent auction. I'm Trinity, and with the help of Ms. Hayward, Ms. Craig, and all our donors and supporters, we were able to put together this silent auction to help raise money to support the Cute Syndrome Foundation and those living with SCNA Day. Many of the items and experiences donated to the auction were handmade and gifted by friends and family members of those living with SCNA Day. To allow anyone who wants to to participate in the auction, it will be held online and in person from 5 p.m. December 2nd to 2 p.m. December 3rd Central Time Zone. The web address for the auction is www.givebutter.com slash TCSF auction slash auction. From there, you should be able to set up a profile and start bidding. Thank you all for your support and enjoy the auction. Go eat. <laughs> Hello everyone. I hope you have enjoyed dinner. We have plenty more out there, so if you need to go out and get seconds, we also have dessert, which I know a few people missed. So if you get out of these doors, take a left, and there's some lovely dessert for you as well. Now, I know we're all eating, so could please continue to eat, but we are gonna go ahead and continue with our program to try to stay on time. So I'd now like to introduce Daniel Hayward. Daniel is the mother of an SCNAA warrior named Lucy, and she is a TCSF volunteer. She also worked along the side of Trinity Young in making her vision of the silent auction become a reality. So if you will welcome Daniel Hayward. Casey. 
I am so appreciative of this opportunity to share a little bit of my daughter's story and our family's journey with SCNA Day with all of you tonight. My name is Danielle Hayward and I'm mom to Lucy, a two-year-old girl living with SCNA Day related epilepsy, disordered movement, and global developmental delay. Lucy is nonverbal and non-ambulatory. My husband, Phil, and I are type A planners. Phil is a major in the United States Army, and I spent 10 years as a marketing manager. When we found out that we were expecting our first child, we instantly went into planning mode. We read baby and parenting books, researched every item we put in our registry, and started saving for our child's college fund. We felt as ready as we could be for our firstborn and couldn't wait for the arrival of our baby girl. After an unremarkable pregnancy, labor, and delivery, Lucy was born in April of 2020. She was the most beautiful, perfect baby that we had ever seen. And we instantly realized she was actually quite remarkable. She looked strong and hearty. Her color was good and her cry was loud, but something was clearly atypical. Lucy's muscle tone was incredibly high and her breathing was rapid and shallow. She was quickly surrounded by doctors and nurses, but nobody knew quite what to make of her. She was taken to the NICU where her medical journey began. None of our careful planning included our newborn needing an MRI, lumbar puncture, tons of labs, and her first EEG in the first 24 hours after birth. I'd planned to take her home wearing the pink bunny onesie I'd bought the day I learned she was a girl to the nursery that we had lovingly decorated. We didn't expect our daughter to have a mystery neurological disorder that left a bunch of level four NICU doctors stumped. While in the NICU, her movement disorder became the most apparent. It grew more and more aggressive. The high tone gave way to intense, non-seizure myoclonic movements. We also, in retrospect, believe that we saw her first seizure during the time she was in the NICU, although at the time it was called um, reflux. We remain eternally grateful to the neurologist who realized these symptoms must be the result of something more and pushed for genetic testing when she was just seven days old. After 17 days in the NICU, Lucy was discharged. We took our baby home with more questions than answers. No part of our plans included maneuvering around our two-story home with a newborn attached to a pulse oximeter and a giant oxygen concentrator, but there we were. We grieved the life that we had imagined and waited for the genetic testing results with bated breath. The test results came back when Lucy was two months old, a de novo SCNA day mutation. No parenting book can prepare you for this kind of diagnosis. Lucy began having tonic-clonic seizures at four months old. From August 2020 through March of 2021, that's just eight months, Lucy was taken to the hospital by EMS in status epilepticus a total of 12 times. Sometimes we would get discharged just to return the following week. We arrived at a new army duty station only a few months before Lucy's birth, and the COVID-19 pandemic had prevented us from building much of a community. Many times we had family quarantine for two weeks so they could safely come and visit Lucy and lend us some much needed in-person support, only for them to witness Lucy stiffen, turn blue, and begin convulsing and screaming, the hallmarks of her major tonic-clonic seizures within a few hours of their arrival. We'd leave in an ambulance, desperately wishing things were different, everyone terrified for our sweet girl. We were in complete survival mode, never quite feeling like we were out of the woods. We wondered if this would be our life forever, sitting at home by ourselves, in and out of the hospital every few weeks, always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Somehow, despite all of this incredibly traumatic and painful medical history, these days, most of the time, Lucy is thriving on her own terms. Sometimes, I forget how different our lives are from the average family. On her good days, Lucy is a sweet, silly, happy two-and-a-half-year-old. She loves Frozen and Sesame Street. She likes to go high on the swings and float in the bathtub and the pool. 
Music brings her so much joy, whether it's listening to favorite songs or banging out tunes on her Fisher Price keyboard. She has a sweet tooth, although these days anything sweet she tastes is ketogenic diet friendly. She has favorite toys and will throw a tantrum if you take something away when she's not quite done playing. She's a girly girl and likes to be dressed in bows and sparkles. Peekaboo and snuggles and kisses from mom and dad make her giggle. Her seizure control has improved. On average, we see a few brief self-resolving seizures a week, and she thankfully returns to baseline quickly. The G-tube feeds, mobility equipment, medication five times a day, and overnight pulse oximetry monitoring barely register with us anymore. Those things are just a small part of who Lucy is, and it's become our family's normal. On her good days, we go, through stroll we go for strolls through the neighborhood. We attend community events. We invite friends over for cookouts. On good days, we think about what it might be like when Lucy starts school. Maybe I'll even go back to work. We dream of fun trips we'll take. We watch Lucy gain new skills. Small things by neurotypical child standards, but giant leaps of progress for Lucy. We dream about what she will accomplish. Accomplish means something different now. That college fund we started will turn into a special needs trust, but we are proud of everything she does. These days, our dreams for Lucy are things like eating more by mouth, improved trunk control, and having a better way to communicate, like using a device. I can tell she has so much to tell us, and I really long to know what she's thinking. The problem is, those are just the good days. Although we don't spend as much time in the hospital anymore, there are still so many unexpected challenges. Everything will be going along just fine, and then suddenly she'll have a day with 15 or more seizures with no specific triggers or warning. Sometimes she'll suddenly start struggling to tolerate her feeds. Or maybe she'll be screaming hysterically in pain for hours, and we have no idea which of her many complexities and comorbidities is causing it. On the bad days, she barely sleeps, leaving us all exhausted. On these days, I wonder if suddenly something has changed for good, and I'll never see my happy girl smile again. If maybe we're back where we were at the beginning and are about to start spending several weeks or months at a time in the hospital. I feel scared to even drive her to the doctor to have her examined, knowing it will be difficult for me to get to her if she starts seizing or vomits in the back seat. I get emotional putting her to bed at night, fearing that I might lose her forever in her sleep to suit up. There's still the occasional hospital admission, sometimes for as long as four weeks. During these times, we cancel plans, simple things like therapy appointments or some social event that we'd hoped we'd get to go to, or larger things like camping trips or holidays with family or a weekend at the beach. We wonder on the bad days, if maybe our plans, hopes, and dreams simply got too big, given our reality. Lucy may be doing better most of the time, but her SCNA day diagnosis remains. Ultimately, we've realized that there is no planning with SCNA day. It's unfortunately in control, and Lucy, Phil, and I are just along for the ride. But what does remain is hope. We hope that a future with better available treatments is within our reach and that Lucy and all of the people in our SCNA Day community will be able to benefit from those advancements. We hope that someday Lucy's good days will far outnumber the bad, that the frequent hospital admissions will become a thing of the past, that Lucy will continue reaching new milestones and lighting up rooms with her big smile. When I imagine our future now, there are no specifics. There are no plans, just love for our sweet, amazing, and extremely remarkable little girl. Thank you. So I don't know if you know this, but I'm a crier. Um, and gosh, thank you, Danielle, for sharing such an impactful story. And I know that that is Danielle and Lucy's story, but every parent in this room can relate to that story. 
Now we're going to segue into, hopefully, a bit of hope. I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Petro, co-founder and chief scientific officer at Praxis Precision Medicines. He is going to present on Prax 562, Potential Next Generation Treatments for DEEs. Thanks, Casey, and to the Foundation for inviting Praxis to share their news around this um, new program. Delighted to be here and to um, this very important group. We've been working with patient groups in various disorders for many years now, and the stories never get any easier to hear. And, you know, I've been working for 20 years in my career to try and convert knowledge into hope. And I think hopefully today we'll hear a little bit about that. And of course, uh, many people at Praxis who are with me today have been a part of bringing these ideas to a reality. Um, so I'm delighted to be sharing it with these colleagues. Um, as Casey said, I was a co-founder of, of Praxis and it sort of began around the end of 2015 when um, the idea of being able to genetically ascertain a patient uh, who's been having seizures became a bit of a reality and we started to understand what was formerly called sporadic epilepsy it actually had very clear genetic underpinnings. And with that knowledge came really the idea that you can have a very targeted approach to how you think about um, delivering a therapy. And we've all heard about antisense oligos and, 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 um, and, and gene therapy and, and specific drugs for various disorders. And, and that's fantastic that there is so much activity. Um, and today we'll talk about this special molecule 562 um, that we think has got some very unique properties that will give it um, a really good opportunity to potentially intervene um, in, for these children. So, um, green is forward. This is what, I have to show this. Click is not clicking. Oh, here it goes. So just a little bit about um, how we think about medications of Praxis. And as I said, we really were inspired um, by the genetics. And you can see here our two broad areas of, of investigation and drug discovery around epilepsy on the left and movement disorders on the right. And you can see that, the, you can see at the ends of these spokes, um, groups of genes uh, that, 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 that are in epilepsy, um, in movement disorders, and also um, overlap in the middle. And that's the thing with the brain, is that some of these genes cross into multiple domains. Um, we all see that in, 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 in some of the um, patients that have got not only seizures, but various comorbidities that, that we're you know, very acutely aware of um, that, 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 that take uh, precious quality of life away from, from these um, beautiful kids. And, and, and for the parents and carers as well. So, and it's not, to be, it's not, it's not unexpected um, given the complexities of the brain, but we are really unraveling and being able to understand individual gene function, which beginning to understand whether it's you know, a function that makes the gene work harder or a mutation that makes the gene work less and how, how that might manifest as a disorder and how you might think about it um, therapeutically. We also have developed a sort of a standard approach um, where we have a, a, a very clear understanding of the genetics and we focus on those targets that we have good certainty of the genetic underpinnings. And then we think it's critical to think about how we tra translate those findings into outcomes. And there are various tools that you require. Um, if you do make a drug, how do you know that you're giving it to the right patient? How do you know that it's being effective in that patient? when some of the changes we hope um, to, to occur as a result of the treatment might take months or years to, take, um, to actually take full effect. What are the early signs that that's actually happening? How do we think about that? What do we need to measure? Um, and that's something that happens very early in our thinking. Um, and then we also try to be very efficient and rigorous because uh, if, you, if you can't deliver quickly, if you can't deliver um, 
on, under budget or on budget, you can't get the money you need in order to make the, the next medicine and the next medicine. So it's something that, that's important um, that we do. Is we, we work very hard as a company to try and drive that principle. Um, we do it because it's important for the patients, because if we're inefficient, if we can't deliver, um, that's opportunity that's lost. Um, so it's a very important uh, part of, of, of the company. And, if, and of course, what the, the, the sort of foundation for all this is that we're patient guided. Um, we, have a, a, we do a lot of work with patient and parent groups. Um, we, we think a lot about the patient journey, about natural history, um, exactly what happens, because the disease isn't a snapshot. It's not a, it's not a child at one week of age, it's a child's whole journey through life. How does the disease change over the course of life? What does that mean for a therapeutic inter intervention? How do you think about a one-year-old versus a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old? And we know that there are, there's going to be thousands and thousands of, of, of older patients who haven't been genetically ascertained that are, you know, that, that are in the system right now. Um, so that patient journey is absolutely critical in, in understanding, um, you know, what we do as an organisation. And this is just a little bit of where a snapshot of what we call our pipeline, uh, where we are. As I mentioned, we've got movement disorders. We have two programs there, uh, very advanced molecule in the central tremor area. Um, but you can see at the bottom a very healthy pipeline in epilepsy and genetic epilepsies. Today we're talking about 562 which is down the bottom on the right there. Um, that's a, a small molecule that you'll see is going to be trialled in patients with SCN8A um, gain-of-function mutations as well as SCN2A. Uh, we have ASO programs and thinking about um, approaches for various other common and rare genetic epilepsies. So we have three um, programs that we expect to be in the clinic by the first quarter of next year. Uh, PRAX222, uh, which is an ASO for SCN2A gain of function um, epileptic encephalopathy. PRAX628, uh, phase one study for focal epilepsy. And PRAX562, um, the EMBOLD study, which um, is going to be of most interest to uh, pe people in this room. And so we, we're very clear, we're clear to begin in the USA with this study, so we're very excited to start uh, to initiate um, the work and the trials here uh, to really um, test, test the metal of this, this, this new molecule. 562, and, and I know we, 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 there's various ways you can think about intervening uh, for a disorder like SCN8A. Um, if it's gain of function, um, you can think of um, antisense oligos to try and remove the, the gene altogether. Um, you can think about making um, specific agents that only interact with the SCN8A molecule. And we know um, there was probably a discussion, I think, earlier today or this evening about efforts in that area. Um, now, Praxis took the approach that you, you can get selectivity where you can try to make a molecule that specifically interacts with a, um, a, a channel, a, this, in this case the SCN8A, but you can also ask the question, um, when a drug interacts with a sodium channel, you, you, can, you can tailor that interaction to only occur when the sodium channel is in a cell that's actually uh, undergoing epileptic activity. So when that happens, the sodium channels themselves experience a different uh, regime of activation, a different voltage regime, and that opens up opportunities to interact with that channel that you wouldn't have in a cell that's behaving normally. And, and the benefit of that is that you can try to think of making an intervention that only gets switched on when you need it and allows normal activity to, to occur. And 562, uh, we, we, we know we did our level best to produce a molecule that has that property. Uh, we would you know, have a, a specificity for disease state activity. And so we call that functional selectivity. And as you can see there, we say superior selectivity uh, for disease state sodium channel um, hyperexcitability. Because of that, uh, that idea that you can specifically tackle the unwanted uh, electrical activity that under, underwrites seizures, you can spare normal function. And if you can successfully do that, you'll get a better safety margin. So you can give more of this drug 
And while you're dealing with the symptoms, you're not introducing drug-specific effects as well. Sodium channels are critical to the function of the brain, and if you interact with them inappropriately, you can cause a lot of side effects and issues as well that we'd all like to um, avoid. Um, and there's other properties about this drug that make it uh, make the levels of the drug very constant in the body. And that's really important because the drug levels vary wildly, the amount of interaction with the channels varies widely, and you can get breakthrough seizures and other effects. So the, 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 the meta metabolic properties of the channel keep it at a very constant level. Now, now, when sodium channels are mutated and when they're functioning in neurons that are also undergoing epileptic activity, um, there are various biophysical properties that are revealed. And this is a particular uh, important one called persistent current. Um, you can think of it as a faucet, a sodium channel, that little um, downward deflection, you can see there's a black one and a red one overlaying it. The black one is a normal channel. Um, you can think of it as a faucet that you open and it's spring-loaded and it closes. So you open it, you let go and it sh shuts and it turns off the water. That's what a sodium channel does. That kicks off the process of electrical signaling in the brain, that one event, critical. Um, and it's sodium channels because there's lots of sodium in our environment. Um, it's, it, you know, this, this sort of activity originated in animals living in the ocean. Salt is the major component of seawater. So sodium is, is a major physiological ion in all life. Um, that's why these channels can allow the selective movement of sodium from outside to inside, and that's what you're measuring electrically with that downward blip. And it's important that the force that turns off completely. Even a little dripping is bad. And that dripping is what we call persistent current, is something that we see in many different variants in SCN 8A and 2A um, genetic uh, mutations that are, that are seen um, in, 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 in cases with DEE. So we wanted to ensure that one of the properties of this molecule was that it interacted with that persistent current state. It blocked the drip. And that was something that the molecule did. There are other properties that I'll talk about later. Um, and you can see here, if you look at this on that particular dripping or persistent current mode, Prax 562 is on the left. Other standard of care molecules are on the right. What this graph shows is on the bottom is how much of the drug you need in your, in your, in your in this case, in, the, you know, in, our, in our test tubes um, as we're assessing the function. And you can see on the vertical axis, it's how strong the effect is. So all drugs essentially go up to 100% efficacy. But what you can see is that the Prax uh, 562 is many, many times more efficient at that than existing therapies for this persistent current. And you can see there that 141 nanomoles uh, versus um, you know, 77,000, 78,000, many orders of magnitude more potent for that persistent current. We think that's going to give it a fingerprint of, um, of, of activity that's going to be very important in controlling um, seizure activity. Now, there are other properties that you can measure, and that's, I know it's all very complicated, these curves. It took me many years to understand everything properly. But fundamentally, each of these parameters tells us about a different property of the channel. So the channels have got do many different things, that they respond differently to different stimuli, whether it's voltage, um, how long a certain voltage, so how, how they react to the act electrical activity of the cell and how drugs then interact with the channels is different. You can see Prax562 on the left, that dashed black line is that persistent current or that leak that I mentioned. Another important feature is that blue line that talks about an activity-dependent interaction of 562 with the channel. You can see, you want the blue line to be as far away from the red as you possibly can and closer to the black. And you can see that 562 has that property, whereas the red line, we believe, when the channel, the, the 562 interacts in that mode, it causes many of the side effects we're trying to avoid. 
So we tried to profile 562 to have the black and the blue on the left and the red as far away as possible as you can. And you can see that we achieve that quite well in that process. And that's what gives us hope that by having such a different profile, we hope that the, 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 the relative effectiveness of this molecule in patients will be greater because it is so different. We didn't try to reinvent the wheel, we tried to make a new thing altogether. Now, what's one way of testing that is by asking, well, how does the drug work in a model of epilepsy? In this model, um, and not, these models aren't always 100% identical to um, the genetic mutation, but they give you a very good indication of how effective these molecules can be in, in a broad range of epilepsies. This is called MES, and I won't go into the details, but you can see on the left, as we increase the dosing of this molecule, we can achieve um, a very, very high level of efficacy. We can increase the time. So this is a test, you trigger the seizure, and you see how long after the triggering event do you see the seizure occur. And you can see on the left that we go from a very, very short latency to a very, very long latency at 10 milligrams. At the same time, you can ask the question, well, what does this drug do to an animal's normal behaviour? In this way, how does, it, how does the animal move around in its cage? And you can see, as you increase the dose of um, the 562, you get an effect on the animal's mobility. The ratio of those two curves, the half point, gives you an idea of how tolerable the drug is, how, how well, how far apart is the, is the dose that causes a good effect versus the dose that might cause some um, unwanted side effects. And we call that the protective index. In this case, it's around 17-fold, which is, when you think about it, fantastic separation. You take one pill, you take two pills, it's not all of a going to sudden push you into that toxic area. There's going to be a bit of leeway, so you can, if you need a bit more efficacy, you've got a bit of margin to move. I think it's a very good therapeutic window. Again, we think as a result of what we tried to design into the molecule. Now, we, we can look at spontaneous seizure models as well. As I mentioned, the first model was a very sort of generic epilepsy model. On the left and on the right, we're looking specifically at um, seizure models in 8A and 2A mice. On the left, it's looking at spontaneous seizures, so we can simply measure for a period of time and you can count how many seizures these mice have over a period of time. And you can see as we increase the dose of 562, we can essentially abolish all seizure activity. So at 10 milligrams per kilogram, so for every kilogram of, of body weight, you give 10 milligrams, and, um, and that's a, a dose that, that we, we use in, in these, roast, these mouse studies. No seizures following that treatment. Likewise, on the, on the model on the right, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutation model of scn 8 a and you can trigger the seizures with a loud sound, so the animal has the mutation, but you also present this, what we call the audiogenic evoked, or a loud, essentially a loud sound, and the animals then undergo a, a sort of a stereotypical behaviour um, and a seizure uh, phenotype. Again, you can see at, at the 10 milligram dosing that that, um, that that triggered seizure was abolished in that high dose group. So very effective in stopping seizures in animal models that are specifically just carrying human or very closely human related mutations. So that gave us some um, hope that, that, that we'd be able to translate these findings into, into patients. So what are we doing towards that? Um, phase one is always an important uh, milestone of, of looking at the effect of the drug in healthy volunteers to make sure it's safe. Um, it's been in over 130 healthy volunteers to now. Um, we found that at, at doses that were much, much higher than what we expect to deliver therapeutically, we didn't find any really serious side effects. So there wasn't a dose that they could, people couldn't tolerate. That MTD is maximum tolerated dose. Normally for drugs, you can bump into that and you say, okay, we cannot go higher than this amount of drug. 
we couldn't get to that point and there's no point going to ridiculously high levels to see it if you already had enough drug in the system. So that was a very good sign that in a, in a normal person that this drug is not, uh, at, at doses that are going to be important to provide therapy and not causing unwanted side effects. Things we did see were very, very mild to moderate um, and, and a little bit of headache and dizziness. Um, so, but nothing really, really serious in that regard. And importantly, when you, when you do give a drug, and I talked before about those translational tools, how do you know that it's working? If you give a small amount of that drug, and it may not be giving you really good seizure control at the very, very low dose, but how do you know that you're on your journey to achieving that? And one of the things you want to do is measure a biomarker of brain activity that helps you understand that. Now, we can do a particular type of, and we've all, I'm sure every parent in this room knows what an EEG is, um, and that's a measure of electrical activity in the brain. Now, there are ways of quantifying that, and you can quantify that, and you can put the drug on board, even though you're not having any outward clinical signs, you can see changes in the electrical activity of the brain. That tells you that the drug's getting in there and it's doing a little bit, and that's really important tool for us as we give one pill and two pill, you can see the increased engagement with the EEG eventually leading to that point where you are going to achieve some um, seizure control. Understanding how you approach those doses is really important. Another method we developed um, called ASSR is basically rather than just looking uh, passively at what the brain does in response to the drug, you can give an audiogenic stimulus and then the ASSR is a way of actually stimulating the brain, looking at its response, and then you understand how the drug impacts that stimulus response. But two really important biomarkers now that we may be able to use for our studies. Um, now, phase two in bold study, as you can see here, um, is expected to initiate in quarter one next year. This is actually going to be um, phase two clinical trial in patients. Um, this is going to be kids with DEEs aged 2 to 18 years of age. We're going to be specifically interested in the safety, tolerability and efficacy of the drug, um, but we are obviously going to be able to see whether it's working, and if it is working in, in, the, in these patients, we'll be able to offer uh, an open label extension. That's something that I think it's very important to, to parents and carers alike that they worry about that. If it is, um, if it is working really, really well, um, what, what next? And, 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 and there, an open label extension is something that's, that's going to be part of this, this, this study. So as, as you're probably you're going to hear more and more about this from Praxis, uh, over, over time we'll be revealing more. Um, the team is, is ready to start to engage with groups, so you'll hear more as, as this study starts to get underway. And we're all very, very uh, much looking forward to the results of this trial, and we hope to be back in a year or two and share in some good news uh, with this community. I'll leave it there. Uh, it's our logo, Dare for More. We try to do that every day, and I know that Karen has got a few words to say about a, um, a survey she wants you to fill in, so thanks very much. Hi, I'm Karen Utley, and I'm the patient advocacy lead for the epilepsy program at Praxis. And Steve, thank you for those, those words. I know I'm also a parent of a child with CDKL5 deficiency disorder, so I know the hope that things like this can bring. Um, we have a survey on your table. If you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, it's a two-question survey. There's also a QR code that um, parents or caregivers can use to register for communications as this moves forward. Um, if you want to receive information about that, you can register for those communications right there from that QR code with your phone. And then if you're a clinician and you happen to have patients and you want to self-identify yourself, not your patients, we know better than that, um, you can fill that form out as well and we'll collect those. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but 2023 sounds pretty exciting for our community. 
All right, so we're going to move into the research session. So I would like to introduce Dr. Banaj Patel, Associate Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Virginia. He will introduce each of the re um, researchers in our research panel. Hello everybody, I hope uh, you're all still awake. I know it's getting late and uh, this year was different because we had an open bar, so you guys have all been drinking at the same time as eating lots of food. But um, I'm very excited to be here again. This really is the highlight of my year coming here and this year it's incredible to see so many people here. So I'm, I'm really excited. And we have um, five great presentations today. So we're gonna start off with the, the very first one. I go up there and push the... Our first um, speaker is Dr. Chris Makinson. Chris? Oh, it's up there, great. Um, Chris did his um, bachelor at uh, Wake Forest. He then went on to uh, do his PhD with uh, Andrew Eskai, who we know. He, Andrew's trained quite a lot of SCNHA researchers. Um, that was at Emory University. And then he went off to do a postdoc at Stanford with John Huguenard and Sergio Pasca. And that's where he learned how to use these iPSC cells, which are these human-derived cells. And he is going to tell us a little bit about the work he's now doing in his own lab as an assistant professor at Columbia University using these um, organoids. Chris? All right, thank you very much for that introduction. I just... Um, Moved to Columbia two years ago, so we've been working hard to get the equipment set up and the models established and trainees trained and so forth. And I'm happy to share with you some of our um, sort of preliminary results. And also to give you a perspective of kind of how our lab is trying to understand how mutations in SCNA day lead to differences at the cellular level and the network level to seizures and behaviors and things like that. There it goes. All right. So just to start off with, so we're all on the same page, you know, we've heard a lot about what sodium channels do, right? They bring sodium into the cell. They initiate the action potential. That's one of the main things, the sort of rising phase of that little event there in, the, in, the, um, in that box is started by the sodium channel, and that's important. This is one of the key ways in which neurons communicate with one another, and it's all started by initiation of these sodium channels. Um, they do that by, uh, via their enrichment in the axon, which is the main output fiber of the cell. There's a lot of these sodium channels in the proximal part of that that um, allows the action potential to, um, to start in that region, and that's how cells are, are constructed such that they can communicate that, um, that signal down the axon. But those sodium channels are expressed throughout the cell. They're not just in the axon. They're also in the receptive parts of the cell, which would be the dendrites that are here in black in the, um, in the diagram. And uh, those, that receptive part of the cell is receiving synaptic inputs from all of the other contacts, right? That's where they, um, all of those synaptic inputs from other cells come in and persistent sodium currents and other currents can boost those, um, those synaptic events and make them stronger and can manipulate them in different ways. So the sodium channels are affecting both the inputs to the cell and it's also affecting how those cells produce and transmit outputs. So there's some complexity there. So those cells, right, are constructed in these networks. They form connections with other cells. And researchers, neuroscientists, and others have been working for over 100 years to try to understand how those cells are connected, which cells are connected to which cells, and what are their, their, the functions that are, um, that are driven by those different types of um, subcompartments. And here we just have you know, three very simplified kind of cartoon models that we use to try to help us understand um, you know, which cells are in which parts of the brain and roughly what are the connections um, involved. And so, you know, we published a study a few years ago showing um, a, a specific deficit in the thalamocortical system that we think is important for a, a type of um, absence seizure that we see in animals with loss of function mutations in SCNA day. 
Um, we've also studied deficits in hippocampal circuitry in the classic trisynaptic um, hippocampal circuit there in the lower part of the, um, uh, of the figure. And recently, we've become more interested in understanding cortical circuitry, which is really quite complex. You have different layers, and you have excitatory and inhibitory cells that are connected in very specific ways. And it's not exactly clear, right, because SCN8 is in all of these cells, right? Why would you get a hyperexcitable state from, you know, a mutation that might reduce or increase the excitability of all of these cells together? You really need to find some sort of imbalance at the circuit level that causes that, that network um, to not be controlled very well such that um, a, a larger sort of synchronous event can occur, which would be the seizure. And so, you know, those microcircuits are then constructed in these larger macrocircuits that we can measure using, you know, EEG or that might show up in behavioral assays and things like that, right? And so what we're trying to do is really draw the connections between a mutation in a channel, effects at the cellular level, effects at the network level, and then at the end of the day, we really want to understand what causes these global synchronous events like seizures or these behavioral um, abnormalities. And so just to give you a specific example of some unpublished work, um, you know, again, there's a lot of complexity in the system, right? There are a lot of cell um, types that we can study, there are a lot of brain regions and so forth. And so we've put a fair amount of effort into developing um, techniques that can sort of give us a snapshot of what the network does that we then can, um, can, under, can analyze and understand, you know, really what specifically is wrong within that network that might um, help us understand the connection between the mutation and the uh, network level effect. And so this is a, a picture of a brain slice that we've, uh, that we've um, made from a mouse. And we've put an electrode in that brain slice uh, to stimulate and then another array of electrodes to record activity um, from the surface of the brain down into the, uh, um, down almost down to where the hippocampus begins. And when we stimulate, you get this like very complex signal. Right, that's in C and D on the, um, on the figure. If you colorize it, that can kind of help you see different, pe different parts of that signal. There are different current sources and sinks, which is where current go is going into cells versus going out of cells. Um, but really to understand that, what we found is, uh, was very helpful is to use specific pharmacology to remove different components of that signal. So in F, we've put on a synaptic blocker. And you can see that the signal stops right where that line is. So this tells us that everything before that line is presynaptic. So that's axons and ions coming into the presynaptic terminal and so forth. And then the things that happen after that would be postsynaptic. So how do those stimulated cells signal to their neighbors? Um, we can use a drug that it influences um, inhibition. We see that certain components of that signal are amplified more than other components, and so these are sort of assays of inhibition. And so from this pharmacological dissection, using the timing of things, we can understand pre- and postsynaptic components and something about excitation and, and inhibition. So we applied this approach to um, an SCN8A loss of function uh, animal, and we're very surprised we didn't see really any differences in any of the measures, which doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, this is, uh, th these are animals that have behavioral abnormalities, they have changes, differences in seizure thresholds. There should be differences in this rather agnostic view of, um, of cortical network function, but we didn't see anything. And so we're kind of thinking, well, you know, maybe the, you know, the, the, the brain slice is, is disconnected from the rest of the, the brain, right? It's a, very, it's a very odd condition, right? for those cells. That's not how the cells are normally in the animal. That's not how they would be in a person. And so we're thinking maybe because the system is so quiet, it kind of masks what might be um, happening due to the mutation. And so we, we tried to push the system into a state that maybe more closely resembles a seizure state or a very active sort of in vivo state. And we did that by putting on a, a low concentration of gabazine, which would remove just a little bit of inhibition, kind of just generally elevate excitability in the network. And when we did that, we ended up seeing 
both changes in excitatory events or in the in the events within the um, within the recording that um, are informative for excitation, and then a huge difference in inhibition. So this sort of gives us a real reason to do a deeper dive into um, uh, into inhibition excitation balance, and in particular to look at inhibitory signaling. So this is another um, bit of data which is a little bit more specific than that general sort of network assay. We're trying to parse these, um, you know, these aggregate signals using drugs and so forth. In this case, what we're doing is taking a very small glass electrode and forming a connection with an individual cell and measuring um, the synaptic events uh, that, uh, that that cell is receiving um, more directly. And so we stimulate synaptic events and then we hold the cell at different electrical potentials to, um, to look at, uh, at inhibitory versus excitatory um, conductances. And so um, from this analysis, what we were able to find is that you know, both excitation and inhibition are affected, but the ratio of those things is not different, right? So the system is still reasonably well balanced it's just that everything is kind of dampened, and that's at baseline, right? So that's the condition in which we didn't really see a large network level effect. But again, if you put on gabazine, the response gets kind of wonky, right? You can see that it's, uh, it isn't this really nice, clean sort of response. So there's a lot going on there. Um, but the ratio of inhibition to excitation is quite different. And so this, you know, wh which side uh, of the coin, so to speak, is predominantly affected seems to be state dependent, right? And this is important for us to know when we're using these different model systems. We're trying to infer what happens in, you know, a mouse brain slice, for example, to the intact animal, it, or, or, and then of course to the person. You need to understand that the state of the network is extremely important, and these mutations are gonna play out. They're gonna have different effects when, um, when that network is in different states. Um, so just really briefly, this is mostly for the, uh, the basic scientists in the, in the group. We've been working on these photocage sodium channel blockers um, that uh, we published a version of this last year, and the, and the, um, the next generation of these is really quite, uh, quite nice. They're working extremely well. It's a tool that we're happy to share, so if anyone has interest in this, um, you know, please let me know after the talk. Um, and so basically what we want to know is, you know, um, what, are the, what are these sodium channels doing in these very small subcompartments of the cell? You know, what are they doing in the dendrites? What are they doing in axons and axon branch points um, in presynaptic terminals and so forth? And we have some tools currently where we can manipulate these channels, but we don't really have tools that can manipulate them at the very small spatial and, and, very, um, um, and very tight kind of time scales that are required to really understand the system. Uh, and so we developed a, a saxitoxin molecule in collaboration with a chemistry group at Stanford, uh, Justin Dubois' group, um, that allows us to shine light in a specific location and release a caging compound that allows the, the drug then to become active just in that location. And I just have a few results from that. This is from multi-photon mediated imaging and uncaging, and you can see the cell there in the center in red with the electrode kind of coming down from the side, poking into the cell. Uh, and you can produce action potentials normally, and then when you uncage the, um, the compound, those action potentials sort of go away over a few stimulations, and then um, and then they actually recover over some time afterwards. So we think this will be a powerful experimental tool and we're happy to share it. So let me know if you're interested. Um, so finally, you know, a lot of the lab, um, really most of the lab now I would say is working on um, induced pluripotent stem cell models of various epilepsies. Um, the approach uh, in, in really what an organoid is is a, um, you know, it's a stem cell derived, what we call 3D microphysiological system, okay? So they kind of look like these very small 
chunks of tissue, this is an aggregate of a bunch of those here in the upper, um, upper component, and um, they can be derived from either embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. We typically get, get those from fibroblasts or skin cells. Um, it, what's key is that they self-assemble. So they aren't just, a, just a, a grouping of cells, but they have some structure, right? It isn't perfectly structured like the normal brain, but there is structure that naturally um, develops within the organoid system. Uh, in the cortical organoids, they have layers. Um, they develop diverse cell types that are appropriate for the different brain regions that we're making in the organoids. So in the case of cortical organoids, they have excitatory neurons. They also have astrocytes, which come from a similar um, lineage. Um, there are many different ways to make brain organoids. I, I would say the two, you know, predominant camps are undirected or self-patterned organoids, where you sort of take the stem cells and you push them towards neurons and they turn into all kinds of different neurons, right? And what my lab is doing is really a, um, an adaptation of that approach where we provide additional patterning factors to try to get the cells not to just to become neurons but to become very specific types of neurons or very specific um, brain regions. And then it's, what, this is really key. Those, those um, neurons, right, they develop, they form connections with one another, and they're able to maintain different states of activity. They have function and things like that that you can measure using these classical approaches, like what I've shown you with the, um, with the mouse brain slices. So this is a, uh, an example of a figure from some of the first recordings that we did in the cortical organoid during my, my postdoc, and I, I just want to show you this because um, it sort of highlights that you know, we're capable of building these circuit models now that are very similar to what we've been doing in, um, in, in the mouse preparation for long, um, for, for, for quite some time. Uh, when you stimulate them, they have synaptic events. This is the um, recording there in the center. Um, you can see action potentials, and you can evoke action potentials, and they also have spontaneous activity as well. So within the organoid, they will, um, the cells will connect with, um, with other cells within the system and they'll, they're, they're capable of producing different states of activity. So one thing that we're really excited about is the idea that we can leverage the brain region specific patterning with um, circuit assembly. So, you know, there's quite a bit of research that's been done on, um, you know, the role of SCNA day in different brain regions, in the thalamus, in the cortex, in the brainstem, in the hippocampus, and so forth. Uh, and we know a lot about the cells that comprise those different brain regions. So we have hypotheses about, you know, which types of interactions might be affected and which interactions maybe aren't affected. And so what we're doing is we're taking the stem cells and we're making separately the brain regions that we think are going to be important for, for the disorder and then we combine them to assemble a circuit, right? But we're not trying to you know, build the whole brain and then look at some component within it. We're interested in a circuit first, we build the circuit, and then we try to understand how that circuit is affected by, um, in this case, it would be the SCNA mutation. So we do functional imaging, electrophysiology, and other things. So you know, this is a, a sort of a partial review of some of the circuit and cellular physiology um, studies that, um, that have focused on different parts of the brain. And like I said before, SCNA day is, is virtually everywhere. Um, and, you know, the studies reflect that from early uh, studies of cerebellum cells. There are numerous studies in cortex, um, in the thalamus, hippocampus, and brainstem, and so forth. So it's clearly a complex problem that affects multiple systems. At the same time, right, while we've been doing these studies in mice, in the stem cell world, there's been a huge amount of work um, going into defining the factors that are required to turn stem cells into different parts of the brain. And so what my lab is doing is matching, you know, this world where you can make a, a cortical model or a striatum or a thalamus and so forth with what we know from other researchers who've been studying um, SE and for a long time to build these, um, these circuit models and then use that 
um, for drug testing and other things. So um, with that, uh, I would like to uh, just thank my team. Uh, you know, I think it takes a lot to move to New York uh, with, a, with a new investigator, but we've done really well with, um, with um, finding really fantastic trainees and, and so forth, and we have excellent collaborators as well. And we've been fortunate when it um, when it comes to grants. And recently, we uh, received the uh, director's new innovator award of the DP2, which is really specifically to look at this circuit um, construction hypothesis. And SCNA Day is one of the um, one of the mutations or one of the genes that we'll be studying in that project. So, if we have any time, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank, thank you, Chris. That was that was incredible work. Um, it's very exciting that you're working on the human organoids. We have time for one or possibly two questions. There's one here. Hey, Chris. Excuse me. <laughs> hey, Chris. Great talk. Um, I was wondering if I really like the Gabazine experiments, but I wonder if you've thought about looking at other systems like. Um, neuromodulators even, because that's just totally cut out of the slices. And then following up on that, what do you think would happen? And has anybody like looked at LFP in the cortex when they're doing these things to see anything that might represent the in vivo state? Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, really good, that's a really good question, right? I mean, these neuromodulators, they come from outside of the cortex, right? That's not part of the system, but the receptors are there, and presumably you could activate them by adding on those, those drugs exogenously. And I know there's been a lot of work in the hippocampus on adding you know, different neuromodulators, and you can see different rhythms jet, um, emerge uh, in, in those contexts. I, I actually really like that idea because, you know, one concern with with using gabazine is that you're affecting a part of the system that's certainly affected by the mutation itself, right? And not that that wouldn't be the case with the neuromodulators, but it, it, I kind of like the idea of having something that's really separate to the system that would affect excitability, that, but leaves the system otherwise intact, and then that gives you the best chance of seeing what sort of disease-relevant phenotypes there are. You're not going to like mask a phenotype because you're blocking some of the inhibition with the drug, for example. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good point. We haven't done, it. We haven't done that, though. OK, we've got one last question here. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing data. I, I like it pretty much, you, especially because you, you, are, you answer some of my question with the second part, which is, which is interesting. I wonder whether you took into consideration the evolutive age of the, the mice that you use as a model in, in this context, and especially if, which kind of variant did you try as a model? Because I think it is amazing. The idea to try to model the network is very important. But of course, uh, you know, my, uh, my new clinician, as a clinician, it's pretty clear cut that the, the system involved in the different subphenotypes are different. So that means that this, this balance has to be, I mean, distributed different way according to the different. So this has to be taken into consideration just to be, to make it really translational. And it will be amazing to merge, I mean, this kind of research with the clinics and try to, to, to target better the different phenotypes. Yeah, I, I think that's the hope for what we, we hope to eventually get to the point where the human cellular models can help us do that, right? Where we can take, you know, patient cells and make organoids from those patients. And, you know, it, it's definitely, I mean, it's challenging to do that. Um, it, it, it's, um, you, you know, I mean, we, we have, we're sort of taking two parallel approaches. So one is to, introduce the mutations on a consistent background where we know what to expect from those cells. We know what kind of organoids they make and how much activity is in them and so forth. And then we'll engineer into that sort of control background um, uh, line the mutations of interest, right? Now what you lose in that case is any effect of, you know, like of that patient's <clears throat> That patient, excuse me, that patient's genetic background that might also be playing a role. And so another approach would be to take patient lines and then correct them so that you had the control from that standpoint. And that's the other way that we're going. It, maybe this is a nice time to, to mention, 
we're always looking to include more you know, patient lines. So if anyone has them or is interested in making them, you know, reach out to me and, and, and maybe we can include you know, um, more lines in the study. Um, I don't know if that answers your, your question exactly, but that's more or less how we're thinking about that. I mean, polygenic risk and background and all these things are enormously important in the mouse studies and in the human studies, but it's, it's also something that's really difficult to study in, in the context of how difficult all this other stuff is to study even when you hold those things as a constant, like with you know, um, animals that are in the exact same background, for example. That, that's the hope, is that these studies will lead to some sort of general rules that we can use to and apply in, in other ways. I don't know if that will be the case, but that's what we hope. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from, yeah. from that. Thank you, Chris. That Thanks was everyone. wonderful. Okay, our next speaker is Raquel Morales. Raquel is uh, a PhD candidate in my lab. She graduated from the College of William and Mary and then spent one whole year at the Volum Institute doing some research as a postback. And uh, the, the UVA, we were very fortunate to attract her into our program and she joined my lab and is now uh, a third year. So she's gonna tell you a little bit about her work on ATA focusing on parvalbumin um, neurons, which are interneurons. Thank you, Raquel. Hi, everyone. Um, we are really fortunate to get the ball rolling on inhibition and everything with Chris's talk. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into it with my talk. Um, so I'm talking today about parvalvimin positive interneurons in SCNA day epilepsy. And uh, they are an inhibitory subtype, and so I'll start off by talking a little bit about the network and different cell types um, in the general network, and then I'll get into SCNA day. Um, so there are a couple different types of cells in the brain. A very simple network is there are pyramidal cells, which are excitatory, um, and inhibitory cells, which inhibit those excitatory pyramidal cells. And in thinking about this, um, a sort of analogy that might make it more accessible to some people um, is thinking about a car and getting the car to go. Uh, so the excitatory cells are sort of an accelerator, um, whereas the inhibitory cells sort of provide the brake. Um, and so this is just sort of to introduce you to what we're thinking about. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about inhibitory interneurons. Um, so there are two main types of inhibitory cells, probalvimin positive and somatostatin positive, um, which I call PV and SST. And these, both, these types of interneurons are both implicated in Dravet syndrome, which sort of indicates to us that they are important in genetic epilepsy syndromes. And uh, previous work in our lab from Eric Wenger, who some of you might know, uh, shows that SST interneurons contribute to seizures in SCNA day. And PV interneurons uh, actually fire at higher frequencies than SST interneurons, and they directly inhibit excitatory cells, the soma. And so what that means is they might provide more direct inhibition and sort of a, a harder on and off switch. Uh, somatostatin cells are very important, and they uh, are sort of more important in fine tuning generally. Um, but no one has studied PV inhibitory interneurons and how they're affected in SCNA day encephalopathy. And so that's sort of what the basis of my thesis work is going to be on. And um, we're going to start off by talking about, sorry, it's not clicking. Uh, we're talking about uh, a mouse model of SCNA day. And so using the R1872W SCNA patient mutation, uh, Mira Meisler at the University of Michigan generated a conditional knock-in mouse. And what we used that for is um, we were able to generate a mouse that expresses an SCNA day patient mutation exclusively in PV interneurons. And so what that means in the network is that only PV interneurons, not excitatory cells or any other type of interneuron, uh, express this SCNA day mutation. And what that actually results in is spontaneous seizures in these mice. And so um, I think I've played this video. It's not quite working. Um, but I have a video, OK, there we go, of a spontaneous seizure in this mouse. And so what we're going to see is this mouse is going to experience a bout of wild running, like there. Um, 
and then he's going to go into a clonic seizure. And you can see he's, he's having this bout of wild running right here. Um, and this sort of indicates to us that uh, PV inner neurons must have some important function in SCN8A uh, because when these mice have an SCN8A mutation exclusively in PV inner neurons, they're having these clonic seizures. Um, and they have these seizures um, a couple times a week. Uh, they don't experience uh, suit up typically, but it's still a significant finding here. And these seizures are confirmed by EEG. But in thinking about this, uh, our lab is primarily focused on patch clamp electrophysiology. And so, uh, of course, we wanted to understand a little bit more about how these cells uh, function. And so I'll give a little introduction on patch clamp electrophysiology. Um, and so we have this circuit diagram that I've been using. What we do in patch clamp electrophysiology is we use a small glass micropipette on a specific cell, so in this case, PV interneurons, and so we use this small micropipette to get information uh, from that cell. And so we can record neuronal activity, which is sort of in the form of action potentials, and uh, a single action potential looks something like that, but when we record PV interneuron firing, uh, PV interneurons, as I mentioned earlier, fire very rapidly, and so the firing looks a little bit more like this. And the way that we do this is by uh, giving the cell uh, current injections that elicit this firing. We can also record uh, voltage-gated sodium channel activity and look at more of the flow of sodium current specifically in these PV interneurons. And so now I'm going to get uh, into my data. Uh, so we're going to start out by looking at just the wild type data. So what I did here was uh, I sort of walk these PV interneurons through multiple current injection steps, and we see that these wild type interneurons continue to fire even at very high current injections. Um, but we also looked at, of course, these W plus interneurons, um, and these W plus interneurons experience something called depolarization block. And what depolarization block is, is these cells basically have so much stimulation that um, they're very, very depolarized, and the sodium channels are usually not really available to uh, create more action potentials. And so that creates this depolarization block, which results in these interneurons not firing and not providing inhibition to the excitatory cells in the cortex. Uh, we see this in our W plus mice, and we also used uh, the D plus model of SCNA, and that's a global mutation model. So these um, mice have the N1768 demutation expressed in all cells, and we see that the depolarization block phenotype is even more severe. So throughout my presentation, I use blue to represent W plus and red to represent D plus, and we can see uh, the firing frequency here. So the blue, uh, the W plus are initially hyperexcitable, but fall prone to depolarization block, and the D plus mice uh, are even more prone to depolarization block. And so that's sort of indicating to us that uh, these neurons are hypo-excitable, which would affect uh, the network overall by increasing excitability. So next, we decided to look at the sodium currents. And sort of in talking about persistent sodium current, we already had a little bit of an introduction to this, uh, but it's my presentation, so I'll show you guys real quick again. Um, but sodium channels have uh, sort of a couple different states that they can be in. They can be closed, and that means that um, no sodium can go through them. If they're open, sodium can go through them, and if they're inactivated, sodium cannot go through. Um, but sometimes when we have mutations in a sodium channel, um, their inactivation might be impaired, which would allow the sodium to sort of trickle through, um, which is something that could lead to uh, epilepsy. And so we've seen this in Michael Hammer's initial paper on SCNA day, looking at the N1768 demutation and the persistent sodium current there. So this is sort of something that, um, this is sort of what it looks like to have increased persistent sodium current. And so to assess this in PV interneurons, I used slow voltage ramps and saw that in both the D plus and W plus PV interneurons, the persistent sodium current is increased. And so what that means is that uh, these interneurons are having more persistent sodium current at all times, and this might contribute to that depolarization block phenotype, uh, considering that they, this might contribute to the increased unavailability of channels. 
And so, as a summary, sort of what we're thinking is that in wild types, uh, the PV interneurons and the excitatory cells have normal intrinsic function, and these mice don't have seizures. Um, when we have an SC data mutation exclusively in PV interneurons, uh, the PV interneurons are impaired, resulting in reduced inhibition. And that reduced inhibition, the uh, lower on sort of the breaks of the system, results in increased excitation. Um, and that's what makes these mice susceptible to seizures. And then when we're thinking about the global mutation model, uh, the SNAD D plus, uh, the PV cells are impaired, and so they, there's an impaired inhibition, and there's also impaired excitation. And so these mice are even more susceptible to seizures, and sort of just, it helps us think about the whole network. And so our overall hypothesis is that the impaired function of these PV inhibitory interneurons uh, drives the hyperexcitability in excitatory neurons and increases the seizure susceptibility overall. Um, but thank you so much. I really appreciate having the opportunity to present my thesis work here. And uh, thank you to my lab, Minaj um, and Ian, who have been really, really wonderful at uh, helping me with all of these experiments. So thank you. We have a couple of questions. I'll go to Steve first. Thanks, Panaj. That was lovely. Um, we've been looking at gain of function mutations in 1A that give a very specific, more than Drave syndrome mm -hmm. phenotype. And we, you know, I think earlier published on this idea of depolarization block, but more recently looked at more mutations. And it was clear that not every mutation is going to lead to depolarization block. And when we did some sort of computational analysis, we did find some paradoxical findings whereby even increased inhibition can lead to this network level increased excitability. So, because it's probably very unlikely that every mutation is going to lead to, I think these ones are quite severe. Um, from what I understand, Chris jolted my memory of that. Um, but it may not happen for every single um, gain of function mutation. And so it's just worth thinking, and it'd be a great problem to solve because those 1A mutations are going to be in these PV interneurons, obviously, and maybe you know, having a slightly different effect through back forward propagation. But it might be interesting to see if there's an emergent other pathology that's less obvious, but obviously as important. So it'd be, I don't know, be good to think about that, um, how, we, how you might even investigate that. Absolutely. We've, I think um, that's been the paradoxical sort of hyperexcitability has also been shown in SCN2A mutations, and I think it affects sort of the, the interplay between the potassium and sodium channels, so that's something to look at for sure. Okay, we have a question over here. Hi, thanks. Uh, nice talk. Um, I was wondering just on the depolarization block, it's, you know, there's kind of a few theories around what might cause depolarization block. And one of them, a prevalent theory, is that it's because of more sodium channel inactivation accumulating over the, at those higher depolarizations. But you're using a mutation that causes le an impairment of inactivation, yet you're getting more depolarization blocks. So it's a little bit paradoxical to me. I'm just wondering what your kind of mechanistic hypothesis is for that. Yeah, so that impaired inactivation theoretically uh, would lead to the increased persistent sodium current. And that increased persistent sodium current is sort of going on all the time, and that generally increases the depolarization of everything. Um, and so that depolarization is, is sort of what leads to the increase in activation. The, the, the channels are going to probably inactivate eventually. Um, or, sorry, I'm not, maybe I'll talk with you about this later, but um, I'm... I, th I, think, I think what you're alluding to is uh, we don't know the recovery from inactivation of these channels. And so we think... Uh, that's something that you're looking at, yeah, is that exactly. perhaps they're taking longer to recover, and so they get trapped in the inactivated state at those voltages, and they just can't recover to give you an action potential. But we can, we can talk more about that later. I think we'll have time for one more question here before we have to move on. Thanks, Raquel. Great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the seizure phenotype. Is it all the mice, all the W-plus mice that have seizures, or only a few of them? 
So it's all the ones that we've recorded. We've um, got EEG recordings of five mice, and they all have seizures starting at about seven or eight weeks. Um, and we know that these mice also have audiogenic seizures beginning at about three weeks. And so, um, yes, to answer your question, all of them that we know of do have them. I've, I've witnessed them have a spontaneous seizure myself, like without even EEGs. So, yes. Okay, thank you, Raquel. That was lovely. Okay, so we're in for a real treat now. We have three speakers coming up to the uh, podium, um, but I'm going to introduce Madeline. Madeline, um, many of you may know, is uh, Margot's mother, and uh, Madeline did her uh, undergraduate at McGill and then went off to do uh, a master's and a PhD at the University of uh, King's College London, and then a postdoc at MIT, and now she's an assistant professor at Tufts University. And I'll let Madeline introduce the other two. Hi, everyone. So in the spirit of this uh, meeting, um, I thought I would bring together the clinician, family, and researcher experience. Uh, my husband, Chris, and I are academic researchers, have never worked on epilepsy, but after our daughter, Margot, was diagnosed with a um, mutation in SCN8A, we just needed to start research in our own labs. And then our neurologist is here as well, Chris Skates from Boston Children's. And so we're going to talk to you about kind of what we're doing um, at different levels to use uh, target alternative splicing to treat SCNA day epilepsy. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chris Burge. Um, my lab at MIT does uh, molecular biology and uh, computational biology. Um, so we know from the SCNA day registry that there are over uh, 25 uh, genetic variants at 16 different sites in uh, exon 5 of SCNA8A. Um, so exon 5 encodes portions of two transmembrane helices, uh, including the voltage sensor uh, in domain 1 of SCN8A. And this domain uh, does not have any mouse models uh, currently, um, and there are few in vitro studies uh, of this domain. Uh, so uh, in our gene, in our SCN8A genes, there are two copies of uh, exon 5 that are called 5N, or neonatal, and 5A, or adult, uh, which differ uh, by two amino acids and encode uh, functionally similar but not identical NAV 1.6 uh, sodium channel uh, proteins. And so we know from RNA-seq studies in both uh, hum during human development as well as during mouse uh, that the 5N uh, exon and isoform are predominant uh, up to about the age of six months. Uh, and then the 5A uh, gradually takes over uh, through uh, adulthood. Uh, so our hypothesis is that for patients with gain-of-function uh, variants in the 5N exon, if we could induce a switch to the 5A exon, uh, then this would restore more normal uh, NAV 1.6 uh, activity. Um, so basically, we would potentially introduce an antisense oligonucleotide that would block uh, the splicing of exon 5N using a chemistry similar to what's used in Spinraza, for, uh, which is an FDA-approved uh, ASO treatment for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and then that would uh, block the production of the 5N isoform and associated uh, mutant uh, sodium channel um, and instead produce uh, the, the 5A uh, version of NAV uh, 1.6. So um, the goal right now is to try and develop these splice switching ASOs to try and treat uh, SCNA day epilepsy. And so the first thing we're doing in my own lab is um, well, contracting out the generation of a mouse model with a mutation gain of function in exon 5N, and so that should be ready in March. Um, and then we are uh, screening and identifying ASOs that induce a switch in the splicing from um, including exon 5N to then including exon 5A. And then the goal is to evaluate the effect of this splice switch, both in the healthy mouse and also in this diseased model that we've created. And this is work led by a grad student in my lab, Haley Dame. So I'll just show you some of the work that we've started to do on this and this is still quite new. So we've been wanting to develop an assay to rigorously quantify the levels of these different exons, and so because there's the same, the same length, this is a little more challenging than doing just an RT-PCR, so 
we can take the brain from mice at different ages, um, extract the mRNA, run an RT-PCR, and then do exon-specific restriction digest so that we can um, have a specific digestion of either 5N or 5A on a gel and then quantify the ratio. And so we started by doing a time course by isolating the brains of mice from E10, E17, um, and so that's in the embryonic state before the mice are born, and then at three days old, and then at the adult. And so we saw lower 5N than what compared to the RNA-seq, but this was from whole brain tissue. And so we did still see this progression where we saw um, more 5N in the embryonic stage, and then it went down when you compared that to the adult stage. But we then wanted to look more closely at specific regions of the brain, and so that are, we know are high in SCN8A, so we isolated the brain of neonatal mice and uh, dissected out the cortex, the cerebellum, and the hippocampus, and we dissected those regions, um, uh, dissociated the cells, and grew them in culture, and extracted the mRNA, and did our assay to measure this ratio of the 5N versus the 5A. And as you can see from these data in all three brain regions, we were able to see about 60% 5N inclusion, which matches up with the RNA-seq data that had been uh, published. And so we can rigorously quantify this within our neurons. But then to screen ASOs, this requires um, screening uh, lots of them and doing this um, over lots of different replicates. And we know that culturing primary neurons is not the easiest. And so we also wanted a cell line to be able to screen for this. And so Haley mined publicly available data sets to see uh, which cell lines that we could easily use um, had a high 5N ratio endogenously. And the ND723s, which have abundant SCN8A and where NAV.6 accounts for about 30% of sodium currents, um, did seem to fit the bill. And indeed, when we did the experiments for this, we could see that these cells have a really high 5N abundance, about 80%. So this means that this is a really great screening cell line to be able to test our ASOs and try to identify ones that induce the switch to 5A. So that's what we're currently doing in the lab on the mouse side. And then now we're going to hear also from on the human side. All right. So um, I am a neurologist at, in our epilepsy genetics department, or our program at Boston Children's. And I met Madeline and Chris through Margo um, in our infantile spasms program through this. And and just to give you a very brief background on uh, um, her her um, history, I, I met her after uh, she initially, like many of the stories I've heard, we've heard here, uh, had some initial seizures, was started on Keppra, had not had any benefit. But I met her after developing infantile spasms and right after getting the SCN 8A diagnosis. Um, we were able to successfully treat the infantile spasms, but now, as you can see on the, the graphs, um, she's been on a host of other medications for the uh, tonic seizures. She, as far as the genetics, um, we found that she had two de novo missense pathogenic variants in SCN 8A. They're both actually on the same allele. Um, one is a known gain of function variant in this SCN. Uh, in this uh, 5A exon, which is why part of the reason to study this is, and it's a fairly unique area. Her MRI was normal. She also has developmental delay, uh, hypotonia and cognitive, um, or um, cortical visual impairment. Um, the, uh, Madeline and Chris have done an absolutely amazing job of detailing her seizures and, and drug regimen here, which I, we can't uh, tell you how how uh, ma much easier it makes my job at times. Although I also know how um, agonizing and frustrating it is that we, despite um, our best efforts, can't get our seizures under control at different times. And um, and so we've been working on that. She's also on the ketogenic diet, and and we've been having. Uh, so I think that's the next step. It's really been exciting to see the at the. Um, the next steps for Praxis and, and Neurocrine. 
We're also undertaking some studies with Enlorem to develop an ASO, and uh, through this, the first step is really just a feasibility um, of whether she would be a, a candidate, and so we submitted an application to Enlorem, and they approved that. The timeline for this is really to then go through next generation sequencing a whole genome to really uh, validate that there are no other variants that we'd be targeting, do the ASO screening, and by um, we've sent off fibroblasts to other labs who have generated uh, iPS cells uh, to do some of the preclinical screening work. They will ultimately do the preclinical development of the drug, and then actually we're working with them to get through the, the regulatory states, develop the drug, and then ult ultimately deliver it. So um, there's the other parts of this that we're also working on is not just uh, the seizure uh, susceptibility, but also looking at other markers such as development as well. And so it's been a partnership with, with Enlarm to, to develop this. And we're currently in the middle state of that pipeline as we go uh, forward through this effort. So if there's any questions about that, happy to uh, talk about it as well. But um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting uh, uh, ride for, for us through this process, and um, I appreciate them allowing me to come along. Great. So, so yeah, so with that, we'd like to thank uh, members of my lab, Haley, who's kind of started on this project uh, with me launching into epilepsy. Obviously, my husband's lab that we're collaborating with, our neurologist who didn't hesitate when we brought this idea that we wanted to apply for this and do this research. And we've been uh, grateful to have also amazing collaborators who helped um, with uh, a lot of this, both at Tufts and other places that um, we are also kind of recruiting some into the SCN88 field to help us with this project. So thank you very much and happy to take questions. Any questions? Steve's got one here, and then I, I have a quick question. Um, that was uh, very interesting. Um, I'm just trying to remember how much splicing does convert from neonatal to the adult, or so-called neonatal adult form in humans. We published a little paper, I just totally forgot. Um, so I'm just thinking, this is going to occur naturally to some extent, and I guess you're trying to give it a to shove along, um, but you know, what's that capacity when, when, when your daughter's three or four or five or six years old? And will the seizures naturally resolve? Yeah, so this was a, a big question that, uh, that we had and that uh, and Lorem had and, and, and so forth. And so the, the data shows that you know, up, uh, neonatally, um, around, you know, up to around six months, it's about 50-50. Um, and then very gradually, 5A goes up and, and 5N goes down, so that by adulthood, it might be like 90-10 or something like that. Um, so one of the questions, but, but you know, by age six or 10, you know, it might be 70-30 or something. It doesn't, you know, it's quite gradual. Um, and so one of the questions we had was like, how much mutant sodium channel is too much, you know? Um, and so we uh, <laughs> looked around the literature and we finally hit on some of Miriam Meisler's uh, beautiful work where she had actually generated mice that has kind of different dosages of, of a mutant, you know, a different mutation, but, but a gain of function mutation. Um, and she found that it was about like eight or 10% was enough to give you seizures, but below that you didn't see it. And so, so that would suggest that, you know, eventually Margot's seizures might naturally respond, but it might be not until adulthood and, and sorry, maybe not even then. And so, so it, it yeah, we, we think it's uh, necessary to, um, you know, even with patients with mutations in 5N to try to, um, or variants in 5N, uh, to, to try to intervene uh, sooner. Do you know about any other patients with mutations the, the, there, are, there are some published uh, examples. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. the ones from the, the first slide we have um, within the registry that we can data mine, there's, yeah, over 25 uh, mutations reported in this exon 5. What happens to them? Yeah, so there are some papers, so it's hard because 
uh, they don't often report the actual chromosome location to be able to figure out which exon it's in, so it can be hard to know from the published literature. But there are um, a couple uh, where they did kind of get, gain seizure freedom around seven or eight. So there's two patients where we know that, you know, based off of having that chromosome number, we could figure that out. But it's not that easy to always know. Okay, one last question here before we move on. Um, thank you, wonderful. I, I have one question regarding the, the collection of data in terms of the seizures. I, I spent years of my life trying to make a graph like that and it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, how, how do you do it? That's, that's one question. And the second one is, in terms of resolution of, of this transition from one exon to the other, do we have cell resolution, meaning do we, do we know if it's one cell that it's expressing one and then the other, or if it's a pool of cells that decide to express one and a pool that decides, and, and in that uh, same terms, are they all neurons or glia, or do we have that resolution? Yeah. My graphing is through a graph pad prism software, which most of us scientists use in detailed Excel spreadsheets and me tracking everything religiously. But, so it's, but it's, in terms of the I, cells, yeah. but in terms of the cell work, I mean, so um, I don't think anyone knows that in terms of the ratio. Um, you know, we could mine some, maybe some single cell RNA-seq data where you can look at the levels in, in individual cells, but sometimes that can be complicated to do the splicing analysis in those um, populations because you need uh, deep enough sequencing. Um, and there's no kind of other way, you know, to look by antibodies or something in different cells. So I don't okay. think that's been really done. It's a good question, though, yeah. to, be, to be looked at. Yeah. I was just going to, just as a plug for, for that with the seizure data really quickly. Um, it, that's actually been really helpful as we go through that alarm process to have baseline seizure data, uh, to have that basically as a historical control. So not that every family has to be as detailed and rigorous, but I do think as we start doing and thinking of precision medicine, having some of that baseline seizure data is really helpful uh, going forward. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the same. So my, my parents are great, but they are not as reliable, so I had to transition to computers. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is um, Dr. Wenxi Yu. Uh, Wenxi did his undergraduate in China and then did his PhD at Wayne State University, and Wenxi is now in the lab of Professor Miriam Meisler and he is a postdoctoral researcher there. Wenji? Um, hello, everyone. First, I want to thank the foundation for having me here tonight. So I'm going to share some recent progress from my lab. So. This figure is showing many of the SCNA variants identified in patients with various um, neuronal developmental disorders. And for those depicted in pink, are mostly found in patients with DEE or benign familial infantile epilepsy. And those mutations often makes the neuron hyperexcitable or hyperactive. So our lab has made two mouse models. Each of them carry a different pathogenic uh, mutation found in patients with DEE. The first one is its R1872W mutation. The major impact of this mutation is the making the channel have imp impaired inactivation. And we have made a conditional mouse line, as mentioned by Rick Cowell. So in the presence of Cree recombinase, the mice will express this mutant channel. And the second mouse line is the N1760D mouse. So the major impact of this mutation is elevated persistent current. Both of these mouse lines have spontaneous seizures. So we're trying to exploit them for the development of therapeutics. So since the epileptogenic SCNA mutations cause uh, neuronal hyperexcitability, so in terms of therapeutic development, 
we would like to reduce uh, SNA expression. So we're trying to achieve that with three different strategies. The first one is using antisense oligonucleotide. So AS, uh, we're using a SCN8A specific ASO, which will bind and hybridize to the three prime UTR of SCN8A transcript. And this hybridization will cause degradation of the mRNA and therefore reduce SCN8A expression. So in this experiment, we use our conditional mouse line bred to carry a E2A Cray gene. So the E2A Cray is ubiquitously expressed in all cell types. Um, the mice were treated at postnatal day two by ICV injection of either a control ASO or the SNA ASO. So for the mice received the control ASO, they all developed a single lethal seizure between three to uh, two to three weeks of age. But for the mice that received the SNA ASO, we were able to extend their survival to about four to uh, seven to eight weeks. And if we give the mice a second dose before the first dose wear, uh, wears off, we can further extend the survival of these mice. And we also looked into the SNA transcript levels after the ASO treatment. So if you read the figures on the right, you can see that in three weeks after the ICV injection of ASO, the 8 a transcript level is reduced to 80% of wild type levels. And as time passes and ASO wears off, the 8 a transcript levels will go back to, gradually go back to wild type levels, and then the mice will have seizure and die again. So this one is showing that um, ASO can extend the survival of the mice. But in terms of patient care, the patients always have seizure first, and then they seek for treatment. So we want to figure out if the ASO also work after the uh, development of seizure onset. So this time we use the D-plus mice. These mice will develop uh, their first seizure usually at uh, about eight weeks of age, and they can live another two to five months before they die from seizure. So that gave us some time for treatment. Um, in this experiment, the d mice were visually monitored for the sign of seizure onset, and then they will receive ICV injection of either the control or the SCN8A ASO. Uh, with, repeated, with repeated administration like every four to seven weeks, which are represented by those vertical black lines on the top of the figure. The black curve is representing the mice that received the control ASO. They all die within five months after their first sign of seizures. But for the mice that received repeated treatment of the SCNA ASO, we were able to rescue about half of these mice. And we also performed the EEG analysis on those mice. There's a great reduction in the seizure frequency for the mice that received SCNA and ASO. So, so far, uh, we have shown that ASO is very effective in reducing seizures and also in extending survivals in the mice. But the ASO, SCNA and ASO also comes with some limitations. The first limitation is um, they re uh, for, the, for treating human patient, you need to perform repeated intrathecal injection, which is definitely not a pleasant experience. And the second limitation is the ASO diffuse, uh, very, uh, diffuse, diffuse a lot in the CSF, so which not only get the cerebrum exposed, but also the cerebellum and the spinal cord. We have animal studies suggesting that excessive reduction of SNA in the cerebellum or the spinal cord may cause um, motor function or learning deficits. And if you reduce it too much in the thalamus, you can also get absent seizures, as found by Dr. Mackison. So we want to have some therapeutics that can overcome this limitation. That comes with our second strategy, which is trying to use uh, short hairpin RNA to reduce expression of SCN8A. So for this experiment, we use this viral construct, which has an AAV10 serotype. 
Um, this viral construct has a U6 promoter that drives the expression of the SCHRNA, which will recognize the exon 6 of SCN8A. And this one also have a EGFP promoter can help us identify the neuron that's been transduced. Um, I have to mention this construct was initially designed and used by the Andrew S. Guy lab from Emory University. So basically, we um, borrowed their viral construct. So we basically repeated our ASO experiment by using the asset RNA. So if you look at the figure on the left, the red curve is representing mice that didn't receive any treatment. They all die, uh, develop a final a lethal seizure and die before one month of age. But if you pre perform a single ICV injection of the SHRA virus, you are able to extend their survival profoundly. You can see that about 80% of the mice were able to be rescued by the AAV treatment. And actually, about half of the 12 mice have made it, uh, made it to like their eighth month by a single treatment, so which means it's very long lasting. And this, uh, this SRNA also works in the Dravet mice of uh, DEE as well. So, so far I've shown that this treatment is long lasting. It also comes with another advantage, which is it doesn't diffuse as much as the ASO. So we were able to restrict the administration of this virus by stereotactic injection. We hypothesize that in order to disrupt seizure genesis or seizure propagation, you may not uh, have to cover the whole brain. You may only need to cover the critical regions or a critical region. And our goal is to find those critical regions. So the first region on our list is the hippocampus. That's because there have been many studies suggesting neuronal hyperactivity in the hippocampal pyramidal neurons. So we were able to selectively transduce the CA1 or CA3 pyramidal neurons in the hippocampus or the granule cells in the dentate gyrus. And this sRNA is very effective in reducing uh, expression of SCNA transcript in the treated brain regions and without affecting the ADA transcript levels in other uh, regions that didn't receive treatment. So we are still working on the experiment, the real animal experiment, to see if this uh, treatment, this, if this uh, restricted treatments can stop seizures and extend survival. So far, the data looks very promising. Um, hopefully, I can share the whole story, the whole story, in the near future. Um, although the ASO and SRNA comes with different advantages, but none of them, unfortunately, is allele-specific, which means they reduce both the wild type and the mutant uh, copy of the SCNA. So they still have the potential risk of causing excessive reduction. That's why we're, <coughs> we're trying the third strategy, which is using CRISPR-Cas9 to allele specifically knock out the pathogenic allele. So worst case scenario, we got all the uh, mutant allele knocked out. We still have 50% expression from the wild type allele. And that's enough for survival. So in this figure, we're showing the DNA sequence from the wild type mice, which is shown on the top, and the DNA sequence from the D plus mice. The red nucleotide is representing the causal mutation. But in addition to the causal mutation, the D-plus mice also have eight additional silent mutations, which give us a leverage for designing uh, allele-specific guide RNA. And we have designed four different guide RNA that each contain three or four of the nucleotide that's only present in the D-plus, uh, in the D-allele. And we have ordered, made a, a plasmid and tested its allele specificity first in the test tube. So what I did is I made a 1 kb PCR product from either the wild type allele or the mutant allele. 
And if there's a cleavage of any of the PCR product, you will see fragments in 400 base pair or 600 base pair sizes. So that's, if you look at the figure on the bottom, in the presence of the sgRNA and Cas9, we were able to cause a 100% digestion of the PCR product uh, amplified from the mutant allele. And there's zero digestion of the wild type PCR product. And if you mix the product from the wild type or the mutant allele 50-50, there's still only half of the product got digested. And I believe that's the uh, mutant product. Uh, in, the, in, in the absence of sgRNA, there's just like zero digestion. So, so far, this experiment has proven the allele specificity in test tube. But how about in cells? I have also generated a mouse embryonic fibroblast line from the D-plus mice. That's a diploid cell line that has one wild-type copy and one mutant copy of the SNNA. So I was able to um, de uh, design a plasmid that expressed the Cas9 protein and also the sgRNA. And I trans uh, transfected these uh, MAP cell lines, purified the DNA, and performed next-gen sequencing and trying to um, make an assessment on the allele specificity. So the result, the Data show on the upper part representing the uh, readings from the mutant allele. So you can see that about 10% of the mutant allele remains unedited. The, the most majority of the mutant allele have a different uh, types of indels. About 90% of them have indels. And among the 90% with indels, about 70% are frame shifting indels. However, in the bottom, which is the wild type allele, about 90% of them remain unedited. And for the majority of the rest, there's only single nucleotide uh, substitution. We believe these are actually not uh, editing. These are just either sequencing error or spontaneous uh, mutation because we saw exactly the same number from cell lines that were not transfected with the plasmid. So, right now, <clears throat> I have ordered a AAV PHPEB viral construct to express the working sgRNA. And the PHPEB serotype allows both ICV injection as well as the intravenous injection because this virus can cross the BBB. And I have already bred our D plus mice to carry the Cas9 transgene. So I'm going to test this viral construct by either performing ICV injection or IV injection. The question I'm trying to answer is to see if there's allele-specific cleavage of the mutant allele in the uh, animal. And what's the efficiency or how much percentage of the uh, neurons I'm able to knock out the uh, mutant allele from? And also, I'm trying to answer if this is enough to stop seizure, if this is enough to extend survival, and also, is this enough to even treat the mice post-seizure onset? So hopefully, I can get the answer uh, maybe next year. And I want to thank support from all the Miser Lab members, and especially Sophie Hill. She's a fifth-year graduate student. She did the majority of the ASO work, so the credit should be given to her. And she's also here in the audience. And I also want to thank support from the JAL Lab, the Kitzman Lab, the, and the Geiger Lab for support on data analysis, tissue culture, and stereotactic injection. And below are our founding sources. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions. Yeah. So, um, interesting work. Um, yeah. How did you select the doses of the ASO or the shRNA or in terms of, you know, how did you arrive at those doses? And then the second part, um, interested in your thoughts of why knockdown of NAV16 was effective in the Dravet model? Um, I got the first question. So, we actually tried different doses of the ASO 
all the way up until the mouse couldn't handle the volume of the ASO, not the dosage. Like we inject too much and the mice die immediately after the injection. That's not because of the ASO, it's just like they couldn't handle the volume. And the maximum we tried at P1 injection is 45 microgram, yeah. What's the second question? I think the second one was why does it work so well in the Dravet mice? Oh, um, that's been very interesting because, you know, there's excitatory and inhibitor neurons uh, present in the CNS, and if you disrupt the balance between them, you got seizure. For the Dravet mice, they are happily insufficient in the SCN1A, which had a major impact on the inhibitor neurons. So the inhibitor neuron of the Dravet mice are not that active. But the SCN8A has some, plays a more important role in the excitatory neurons. So we were thinking if you reduce 8A levels in the Dravet mice, you are able to restore the um, imbalance and to help reduce the seizures. And I, that's exactly what we, saw, what we saw. Actually, both the ASO and the SCN8A worked for the Dravet mice as well. Yeah. So I think it's, it's more of a critical time point of when the treatment occurs for the Dravet, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it seems to just continue even after the, the ASO is over. Yeah. In the chat, you have a shout out, incredible work, as well as two questions. Uh, the first is, are mice in your survival studies dying due to SUDEP? And secondly, survival is important, but will you also monitor changes in seizure frequency with Cas9? Uh, I will definitely monitor uh, not only just seizure frequency, but we will also perform like behavioral studies to see if there's any potential adverse effect. Um, yeah. So that's a plan for the Cas9 as well as for the SR attorney treatment. And for the SUDA part, I really couldn't answer because there hasn't been a consensus, um, uh, how to say, um, consensus uh, conclusion on whether these mice actually have SUDAP, like the SUDAP you saw in the patient. So yeah, but Manoj has done a lot of work on study the seizure-induced deaths, and I think he found like um, those mice have apnea after um, they have seizures. And if there's not uh, a timely intervention, sometimes the mice will die from apnea. Yeah, yeah. That was the follow-up question then, do we know why the mice are dying? Yeah. We have suggestions that there's a respirational defect, but there's no conclusive answers right now, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you guys so much for your presentations. I would now like to introduce Mary and Billy Tone to the stage. Billy is one of our most joyful and entertaining SCNAA warriors, and he's accompanied by his mom, Mary, a DCSF volunteer. You're gonna start. Go ahead and start and introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, you going, Mom? You had to tell them who you are. From Syracuse. And where are you from? Twenty. What is this? Twenty-one. How old are you? Twenty. Okay. And Syracuse. Where do you live? Syracuse, New York. I live in. Syracuse. Syracuse. What do you have? Kiss him. Cute syndrome. Because because he's adorable, he told me. And what do you want to say to the doctors? Thank you. And the clinicians. Thank you. And what do you want them to do? Walk, walk, walk. <laughs> Stay up here with me. Okay. Contrary to popular belief, I am actually Billy's mother, despite the pamphlet on your table. That is Billy's trophy mom from Canada. I'm the real deal. So, I'm the one he's stuck with. <laughs> um, this is Mr. William Tony. He was born January 5th, 2002. We call him Billy. And I think that's, uh, despite what we expected, that suits him much better. 
Um, he was um, a regular birth, a very easy pregnancy, um, no history of any problems. He weighed 6'2 at birth in 19 inches. Um, normal birth, 37 weeks. I went early as I did with my other two kids for no particular reason. Normal ultrasounds and fetal activity. So we had no indication that there would be anything going on. I was 38, I had a great big huge stamp on my chart, advanced maternal age, which makes you feel great when you go in there. Um, dad was 41, um, no history of drugs, alcohol, smoking on either mom or dad's part. I did take prescription Synthroid throughout the pregnancy for a thyroid issue that I've had, Graves' disease. Other than that, not even Tylenol or anything like that. So, what happened? Um, Billy started showing early on that he had some delays. Um, things like crawling and walking were delayed for him. I didn't give it a lot of thought, um, unfortunately, because he was our third child. And he actually, um, I skipped a slide here, I think. Oh, you know what? I'm changing my presentation, but not yours. <laughs> that works. I, I feel like I'm the last presenter at the Oscars and the music is playing. <laughs> um, Billy is our third child, and um, I, admittedly, life was very busy. Um, we had two kids who were active in sports and running them around. A um, lot of excuses here. My husband and I both worked shift work. We were both police officers. We worked opposite days off, opposite shifts, and life was absolutely crazy. So. A lot of the red flags that I should have picked up on, I did not. Instead, I was giving myself accolades for what a fabulous parent I was with this great third child, who was very quiet, happy all the time, rarely complained about anything. Okay. And honestly, there were even times that I thought, oh my God, did I feed him? He, he's not crying, I don't remember. Um, all things that a first-time parent would be calling the doctor every day for. Uh -huh. and. <laughs> And instead, I'm just saying, oh my God, finally, a good one. You know, everything's quiet and going well. So I didn't think much of it. <laughs> Delays in speech and crawling, um, I blamed on my oldest child, his sister, because she adored Billy, as Mar did Joe. Margaret. Margaret. And she carried him everywhere, and she spoke for him. So I attributed a lot of that to, he doesn't need to talk because somebody's doing it for him, and he doesn't need to walk because somebody's always carrying him somewhere. So it, totally my fault. Miss a lot of the things that I should not have missed. But, you know, in retrospect, um, yeah, bad, not mother of the year at that point. Um, so... He ends up in early intervention at the recommendation of a pediatrician. We enroll him in preschool. Um, he goes in at three and four years of age for school, gets PT, OT, speech, and a special ed teacher. Um, he ended up with pneumonia. He tended to, to have a lot of pneumonias um, and at one point was hospitalized for pneumonia. And he ended up, while we were in the hospital, falling under the care of the neurology lab. And that is because at one of our parent meetings at preschool, one of the teachers said to us, we think he's having seizures. What? I'm like, that is exactly what I said. You are a wonderful co-presenter. Um, I, totally oblivious. I had no idea that there was anything other than a grand mal seizure, what we called them at that time. I'm like, well, he's, we have never seen him fall on the floor, seize, anything like that. And at that point, she explained to me that, you know, we're seeing him drop his head a little bit. He's closing his eyes a little bit. And I said, you know what? We see that at home all the time. Goofball. And we thought, uh, not that you were a goofball, we thought you were tired. Um, and I wrote it off to that. And I think a huge amount of parents and teachers have no idea that that's an absence seizure. So when he got pneumonia, um, we ended up in the hospital for that, but it bumped us up the neurology list, thank God, because we were on a pretty extensive wait list. And it was gonna be a long time before we see a, a neurologist. So they did the EEG while we were there. Um, 
and we ended up seeing a fabulous Dr. Carl Crosley at Upstate, Syracuse, New York, Syracuse, New York, um, who diagnosed Billy with atypical absence seizures and prescribed him with Depakote, and he was on Depakote for three and a half years and did well with that. Um, saw a huge reduction in the seizures that we were seeing. Um, significant delays in everything though, you know, as far as physical attributes and intellectually severe delays. Um, we went through the normal testing at that point, fish, autism, Angelman, all of those things. He showed negative on, on all of that. We didn't do anything more, and a lot of people alluded tonight to the delay in having a diagnosis. And I'll tell you what, the bottom line is, it's the insurance companies that have created that, in my humble parent opinion. We couldn't have more testing because my insurance wouldn't approve it. It was really expensive at that time. So we didn't have any diagnosis other than he has epilepsy and got on the Depakote and didn't think much more of it. He did fine on that. Um, three and a half years into this, um, our doctor Dr. did a regular EEG and it was clean. We had a normal EEG and his quote was, uh, I think Billy deserves a chance. So Woo-hoo. he pulled him off the Depakote. <laughs> Woo hoo. <laughs> well, not yet. Um, <laughs> took him off Depakote in December of 2009, and by June of 2010, uh, we were seeing the absence seizures again. The head drop, the um, blinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. stop speaking in the middle of a sentence and he can't return to it. Um, so we ended up adding Lamactyl. I'm gonna mispronounce all these names, I'm sorry. Um, due to uh, absence seizure reoccurrence. That didn't really do anything for us, so we went back on Depakote as well. He added that. Um, and his EEG in June showed profound abnormal tracing consistent yeah. with primary generalized ep- epilepsy. Um, that's it. No, that's not it. I'm sorry. The, the audience is hoping that's it, but it's not yet. Um, we, um, at that point, our doctor, unfortunately, selfishly decided he's going to retire. Goofball. Um, goofball, yes, we'll go with that. Um, and at this point, we're still two years away from Dr. Hammer even discovering a CNA day. So our doctor retires, and we ended up with a new physician in Syracuse, Dr. upstate. Hayes. No, no, not yet. That's the grand finale. Hold off. <laughs> so October 2011, uh, we have a new doctor come to upstate. Um, and, and it's somebody I think that um, may not have been real strong in the pediatric side, tended to add medicines really fast um, yeah. and not be um, tolerant enough to let things acclimate. So um, I also at that time was having a lot of trouble with school who was complaining about Billy's behavior. What? So, um, <laughs> right. remember going to the office? Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. So we ended up I'll cut this short. Um, we were on a ton of medicine. Um, we were on Capra and ended up switching to zanisamide because um, the neurologist felt that would be better for his behavior issues. Um, and we ended up um, adding so many medications at once and trying to wean at the same time that Billy ended up in the hospital with drug-induced pancreatitis. And the smart people in the group will understand these numbers, not me, but his lipase was 2,300 upon admission at the hospital. Normal was zero to 160. His amylase, I think I'm saying that right, was 14,000 plus, and normal is 23 to 85. The person that discovered this pancreatitis actually was our old retired doctor who came back to see old patients because yeah. the new doctor was so far behind. And we happened to thank God to get him and we saw him. It was a very late appointment in the day. It was almost five o'clock. And I remember him taking Billy's paperwork and standing in a corner. His back was to us and there was a string of profanities coming out of his mouth, which he wasn't that type of guy. I'm like, what is he reading? Well, he was reading the blood work and he's like, you've got to get to the ER right away. So he was in for 11 days. They told us he was within a day or two of organ failure. Um, and, and that was a horrible, horrible 
horrific time for us. I, I find His, it. Um, he was acting, he was like a zombie, worse than any uh, heroin addict you've ever seen. He couldn't move, he couldn't speak, he had severe headaches, hiccups all day, low-grade fevers, zombie behavior. We had to pull him out of school um, because fall. they were complaining, obviously, he can't be there like that. Um, so it was just a very, very ugly time. Um, so we get back on um, a regimen. He can never take zanisamide and Depakote again. He's now labeled as allergic to them. We end up on Anfi with Ethosuximide and Keppra for several years. Um, that was yeah, I gotta remember. So in 2015, that new neurologist that we had had a, an internal conflict with his staff and quit. Uh, with zero notice, like at eight o'clock in the morning, literally called in and said, yeah, I'm not coming back, and moved across the country. No notice, no referral to no doctor, nothing. So we were really stuck. We live, <laughs> we live in Syracuse, New York. We ended up in Rochester at uh, URMC, Strong Hospital, um, and this woman it walks on water, as she's far as fantastic. I'm concerned. Um, she's fantastic. She's Dr. Ina Hughes. She's a pediatric neurologist. Um, we end up with her. She um, Billy? did another EEG of Billy and decided, you know what, we're going to reduce his meds. He's on way too much stuff. She started with Amphi, then Keppra. And by June of 2016, Billy was off all medications. I remember at one time questioning her about the difference in the, the two um, manners between the physicians, and I remember her saying, hmm, he must have missed a couple of studies. I'm like, oh boy. Um, and Billy has... <laughs> We did not plan this. We didn't practice this. You're amazing. Um, and um, no, we're not calling people up. Um, <laughs> and she said, I think that he's outgrown his seizures and he's always going to have abnormal EEGs, but I don't think the side effects of the medications are worth having him on anything. So that is why this woman walks on water in our life. She's amazing. She is the first person that ordered an epilepsy panel. She is the person that, well, she didn't diagnose him, but she presented to us our finding of uh, Billy actually has an answer. He has SCN8A. And as soon as she announced that in the office, do you remember what you said? Doctor. Uh, she, he said, I'm on Facebook now because she told us about the acute syndrome group and he was so excited that he Sorry was on Canada, Facebook Sorry now. Canada. And he met Shelly from Canada, yes. <laughs> the trophy mother. <laughs> um, <laughs> medication history, I'm sorry this is going so long. Um, so. You, you can see him. He's been on everything. I don't have to read thank, everything to you. you. He takes <laughs> he takes B6 for bone strength. He has a huge history of bone fractures, um, osteoporosis. Um, so the, the bottom one here, the Zomita, that is for bone strength. He gets infusions every six months for that. Inju He's had dental Inju issues, um, knee injuries. He's prone to falls and has broken his feet and had knee instances on numerous occasions. <laughs> Oftentimes we didn't know about because he doesn't complain of pain because the thing with Billy is he's lost a function. And he, he absolutely feels virtually no pain. He walks around on broken feet and hello, hello, says hello. nothing. It's a very rare thing if he complains of pain. When he had pancreatitis, he was crying in pain. We knew it was bad. So. If he says something hurts, we know it's really, really bad. Um, his diagnoses right now, atypical absence epilepsy, SCN8A, neuromuscular scoliosis, moderate intellectual disability, he has a disability of, or an IQ of 35 to 49, ADHD, anxiety, osteoporosis, osteopenia, paramobility, developmental delay. He's not autistic though. Um, when we went for that testing, the um, doctor actually said, I diagnosed him watching him in the waiting room, 
And I'm like, really? And odd? It was odd, but the thing was, Billy was only like three, and um, I was sitting completely by myself in the waiting room, and Billy was sitting with like a family of eight black people and talking to them and immersed in his family, and I'm by myself. (laughs) And he's probably sharing completely inappropriate things with these lovely people who were so nice. Um, but he said, I can tell he's not autistic. He has autistic tendencies, though. In, 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 um, in back surgery. Flapping of the arms when he's nervous, echolalia. He needs a routine schedule. He needs constant reassurances um, to the point that it's, you know, it drives me crazy, as I'm sure it does for other parents with kids that have similar situations. Um, he mentioned to you he wants to talk about his surgery. He had back surgery what in August. Talking? Sure. 2018. uh, 2018 was his first scoliosis surgery that came as a surprise to us. We were just having it monitored, and then one visit we showed up, and they said, yeah, it's time. He needs needs to have back surgery. Um, He had to have a second one because his rods became detached. Um, um, He had a pretty severe fall from a horse during therapeutic riding, um, so we ended up with a second surgery. There he is. School, I could talk about school for all day, but to your benefit, I'm not going to. Um, he has an IEP, or did, OTPT speech, adaptive phys ed, special ed, one-to-one teaching assistant, kindergarten through graduation, oh. <laughs> bus with an aide, and um, a 12-month program. Whoever's flipping that, thank you. Um, school, School has not been good, I'm going to be honest. Parents with young kids, stay on top of that. Just watch your um, Just let your mom know. Yeah. Um, it was better for me because I actually, I had retired from my police job and I worked in the school as a teaching Marcellus assistant in, in special ed, so I got to see what really went on and I knew the truth. Um, we had some okay years, mostly. We had... <laughs> we had... <laughs> We had two years that were fabulous, and he made some really good improvements. Um, And then we had some years that were just horrific. Teachers that didn't do what they were supposed to, um, just rough. Um, I I was telling Gabby I would go into meetings and just bring a copy of the New York State Education Law and just put it on the table, and I would flag it with, I put little sticky notes in there, like I had things I'd refer to. I never even opened the book, I don't care. But they didn't know that, so um, we battled with the school on many occasions. Uh, They will get away with anything that they can. And talking to parents across the country, that's not exclusive to us. So um, he repeated several grades. He ended up graduating in um, September. In uh, tw- when did you graduate? 2021. June. Yes. Um, in addition to all of that, we have had to deal with guardianship because once these guys turn 18, at least in New York, um, we can't legally we can't make any of his medical or legal decisions. So we had to go through guardianship, go to court, and actually get custody of him, basically. Um, At the end of that proceeding, um, went through the whole formal process, and the judge asked Bill if he had anything he wanted to say, and he said, my mom takes a lot of naps. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you. On the record. (laughs) At least he didn't say she's drunk a lot, which sometimes... His sister and brother thinks that's funny to share not, with him. Not funny. <laughs> not funny. No, no. Uh, and you've got, you know, just for doctors, remember, parents are dealing with schools, they're dealing with doctors, they're dealing with guardianship, Medicaid, Social Security. It's, it's a lot. It really is a lot. And you add working on top of it, um, it's a lot to handle. It really is. The big thing is, who is Billy? Billy's, I, I think so, you already so see. That? He's a comedian. I would typically call him a wise ass if we weren't in a mixed audience. Um, He's innocent. He loves Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Um, He is very naive. Um, He will not ever understand concepts of danger or strangers. Lock your doors. Bad guys, lock your doors. That's about as far as we get. 
He overshares. He will share his name, his address, invite strangers to our home, typically when we're in Walmart. Um, hello, hello. He has no ability to protect himself. Um, so because of that, he will need constant supervision. We have never left him alone. He will never be left alone, ever, his entire life. Um, and he doesn't want to be left alone. He would be afraid. Um, he's a tech genius. He can so, fix okay. things on a computer or a phone that I can't begin to understand. Take it away, take it away. So I can't explain that to part to you. It's weird, creepy. The, the other part I can't explain, hang on. Um, Michael Hammer at one point called him a savant, savant qualities. Billy, like if you say your birthday is January 24th, he can tell you what day of the week that is. He can also tell you what day of the week it is next year and the year after. And he even can figure in leap year. Can he remembers um, any teacher he's ever had. He can tell you their birthday, their spouse's name, their wedding anniversary, dates of death. Um, fabulous with dates. Fantastic. He can't do math. He cannot add one and one. Has no concept of m numbers at all. Not a single concept of numbers. But he's amazing. He loves the news. He loves going for car rides. Blindly. He likes going to plays and listening to music. Um, he's compassionate. Many of you have had compliments from him. He likes your dress. He'll ask if you're feeling okay. Um, he's the center of our family. He... Um, no. He changed our family dyna dynamics um, completely. Um, we know that he's a child in a man's body. Um, and he um, will always need us there. He needs assistance in bathrooms, showers, grooming. He wouldn't ever be able to pick a temperature of a shower to do that himself. He can't my shave brother, himself. My brother, Your brother can help, yeah. So he is a for forever commitment. Thank God we have siblings who are Shall willing to sign on to that when my husband and I are gone. Um, <laughs> and they have indicated that no matter what, we will take care of them. But, you know, for doctors know that a real concern for parents, you fight your entire life to keep these guys alive, and you go to bed at night wondering what's going to happen to them when we're dead. You know, you want them to go a minute before you. It's just something that we all deal with. <laughs> Even though his med medical issues are so minor in comparison to what other people are going through here, but it, it's, it, it's a worry. I'm okay. gonna worry about living arrangements. Uh, he will always be with us. He won't go to a placement. We just would never do that. Never and, and you'll worry about finances and things like that. You know, and we not. did have to set up a special trust to protect him. We've met hundreds of people through Billy. We've met everyone here. I have no idea who most of you are, but <laughs> you know him. <laughs> and oftentimes I'll be like, who the hell was that? <laughs> but know, you, know, know. you know him and he knows you. Show so Canada. Um, Canada. this is our family. This is uh, my son, son-in-law Scott, my son Joe, Maggie, his sister, who conveniently enough is a special education teacher, so that comes in pretty Western handy. Um, that's my grandson, Keegan, who only competes with Billy for our love, who we just adore, and Billy and my husband, Bertie. So I'm sorry it took so long, I went over my time, but my first presentation had 85 slides. Aren't you glad I was told to cut it down? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I needed a dose of Billy. <laughs> oh, heavens. Okay, let's see. All right. I would now like to introduce Dr. Ian Winker, research assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Virginia. In November of 2021, TCSF provided him with a $25,000 grant towards his research project concerning SUDEP and SNAA epilepsy. He is here today to provide us an update on that grant. Well, thank you for that introduction. So I guess I have this here. 
Um, I don't know how I'm going to follow that. This is not going to be nearly as entertaining. Um, but I am the last scientific talk, I believe. So if you can bear with me for like 10 or 15 minutes, to be honest, I can't tell if any of you are sleeping, so you can do what you want. Um, go to the next slide. Oh, no, not that far. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you very much uh, for having me here to present my work. Um, this is really such a special event, I think, in, in my professional uh, career, really, and in every year. This is one of the most unique things that I've ever done um, to come and present uh, for you all. And also thank you for your contribution to our work. Um, hopefully I'll show you that we've been making good use and um, we have some interesting results. And the title of my talk uh, today then is The State of the Inspiratory Oscillator During Seizure-Induced Apnea, which um, is a mouthful, but hopefully by the end we'll understand what these terms mean and what um, we've learned. All right, so my work is focused on mechanisms of SUDEP, and that is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which I don't really need to describe here. Um, I use preclinical mouse models, and I rely heavily on a couple SCN8A mouse models because they are really fantastic ones. Um, these two listed here, the 1768D and the 1872W, um, were both mutations identified in patients that actually died from SUDEP. Um, which is really unique in, in SUDEP research. Most uh, mutant mice models are just, you know, total knockouts or mutations that aren't associated with someone that actually died from SUDEP. So this is really unique. This is what brought me to the project and, and got me really interested. Um, and as a disclaimer, this whole, everything that I do is uh, concerned with SUDEP. So we're going to uh, talk about SUDEP uh, with the relationship to these mice, and I'm going to talk about how they, they die from seizures and things like that, and I'm going to show one video of a mouse when they die from a seizure, just so uh, we're all prepared for that. Okay, so the overall approach was when I came to this project, um, I knew the mice had seizures, and I knew that they died prematurely, but we had no idea. And I think in the last scientific talk, people had questions about this. So are they dying from SUDEP, and what exactly is happening? And these were all the questions we had. I sat next to Minaj on a plane coming back from the neuroscience meeting, and I asked all these questions, and he said, well, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a lot of questions here. And that's what's really fun for a scientist. Um, so uh, we got into this project just uh, trying to understand what's happening, and that's what's on the left side of this arrow. Just we wanted to observe uh, behaviors, specifically cardiac and respiratory function, because this is what we think is likely failing when there's a sudden death. And then eventually what I knew I wanted to do was work back to the neural circuit mechanisms that underlie these behaviors, um, so that eventually we could you know, maybe find some targets and eliminate some of these really terrible events that happen with seizures. Yeah, so whoop, it starts playing right away. The top trace here is uh, breathing, and the middle is ECG, and the bottom is the EEG. <clears throat> and this mouse uh, in the bottom cage is having a seizure. This initial convulsive phase, we actually have increased breathing and heart rate. Um, and now the mouse is going through a wild running phase, where so the signals aren't very good because of the movement. And the seizure ends with a tonic phase. And we can see in the red signal, the ECG, all this muscle activity that's bleeding through into the ECG lead. But if you look at the top, at the blue signal, that's essentially a flat line. So the mouse is not breathing at this point. They stop breathing during the tonic phase. At the end of the seizure, we can see there still is cardiac activity, albeit at a lower rate, so they have bradycardia, but the mouse will never breathe again. Um, and if we continue this out for 15 minutes or so, eventually the electroactivity of the heart will stop, uh, presumably because the cells in the heart lack oxygen and they can't function anymore. And uh, in every case of premature death that we recorded in these mice, this is ex exactly what it looked like. This is how it happened every time. So the mice had a couple different types of seizures that we observed, at least uh, convulsive seizures, uh, that, uh, that I call tonic or clonic. And so the tonic seizure is what you just saw. A clonic seizure is when um, it's a very similar uh, seizure, except in that tonic phase is replaced with an extended uh, clonic phase uh, with repetitive motions of the forelimbs. Uh, and it also, there was no apnea. There was no stopping of the breathing, and so those seizures were all um, survived, and only a fraction of the tonic seizures were actually fatal. Some were um, non-fatal, so we can compare a couple of them here. 
And hopefully what you can see is that even in the non-fatal seizures, we still have apnea during um, the seizure, during the tonic phase, when we have all this muscle contraction. And so there's kind of two phases. There's this apnea initiation during the seizure that I'm calling seizure-induced apnea. And then there's the persistent um, apnea into the postictal phase or failure of breathing recovery that results in the fatality. And um, we're interested in both of those phases, but today I'm gonna talk to you about the seizure-induced apnea, the one on top, uh, and how, that, how activity in the brain could be generating this apnea. That's our question at this point. And so what I'm showing you now um, is from a paper we published about a year and a half ago with kind of these general observations. A couple other observations we made that are, are useful to bring up are that in these mice, uh, in the fatal seizures, ventilation can rescue them. So we believe, again, underscoring the importance of, of breathing. Um, and also we recorded, there's all this muscle activity, but we also directly recorded from the uh, diaphragm, the main breathing muscle, and found that it was tonically contracted during the tonic phase. And so we think that is the mechanism of um, apnea, at least during the seizure. Um, and so that's sort of driving our thinking for what is being recruited during the seizure, what parts of the brain are being activated during a seizure to cause apnea. And so this is, this is a cartoon to summarize uh, what I just said. Um, and then underneath, uh, this, is sort of, this is from the uh, proposal that I had for, uh, for you guys, so, so it might look familiar to a few of you out there. Um, uh, where we, normally we have uh, what, what I call oscillatory inspiratory activity, which is another mouthful. Um, and that is just that to breathe, we contract our diaphragm to breathe in, and then it relaxes for us to breathe out. And at a minimum, that's what we need. So that's the line on the, uh, the, on the left here. Um, but during the tonic phase, what we're hypothesizing is that there's a tonic inspiratory activity. And this is producing the apnea we see. So before I get into the details of that, I just want to plug that we did also publish a paper recently kind of looking at the neural circuitry uh, where we inhibited forebrain neurons with dread receptors and found that we can inhibit the cortex, including the motor cortex, and we still get the apnea and the tonic phase. So we think that it's in fact lower uh, brain, brainstem circuitry that's involved in uh, creating this apnea. And for this project, we were going down to what's called the ventral respiratory group, which is a region of the ventral medulla that houses um, what I'm calling the inspiratory oscillator. So it's the little gray circle on the diagram here. And this is where your breathing rhythm is generated. So in your heart, you have your SA and AV node. This is what generates um, heartbeats. And for breathing, this is generated in the brain stem. And so here, there's a group of neurons that fire um, phasically and generate this inspiratory rhythm so that we can breathe. And so again, the idea is that they become tonically active due to a seizure um, and, and produce this apnea. And so what we wanted to do was inhibit this inspiratory oscillator. And so we chose to uh, optogenetically stimulate what's called the Botzinger complex. Uh, so that's the orange circle. And this is a group of inhibitory neurons that are expiratory modulated and, um, and have a powerful inhibition on this inspiratory oscillator. And so underneath the... Um, the bottom there, we showed the idea of what we're going for. So if we can inhibit this inspiratory oscillator by stimulating the botzinger com complex, we can break up this tonic inspiration and create a breathing pattern that's somewhat normal. Okay, so uh, photostimulation of the botzinger complex has been accomplished before, um, but usually in anesthetized preparations, but we can't generate seizures when the mice are anesthetized, so we needed to demonstrate this works in conscious animals. So this right here in panel A is just showing you the, the proof of principle. If we look at the blue trace, a second from the bottom, this is breathing. Upward deflections are inspirations. And when we turn on our light and stimulate the Botzinger complex neurons, you can see we never see an inspiration during that time. Uh, so uh, we are in effectively in inhibiting the inspiration. And in fact, we can extend this out for up to 10 seconds. In a couple cases, I did longer and unfortunately killed a couple mice, so we stopped doing that. Um, but it's amazingly effective. I've done similar experiments with other sets of neurons, and uh, usually some other feedback mechanism creeps in and generates breathing, but we're really inhibiting homeostatic breathing at, the, at a choke point so they can't recover. And so it's a very powerful technique is, is my point here.
But the main point is what happens during a seizure? So these mice also have the demutation that we're using here, and they have audiogenic seizures. Um, all of the audiogenic seizures we observe are these tonic seizures. So you can see here in A um, at the bottom, uh, the mouse is having a tonic phase and an apnea. Well, what happens if we photostimulate? That's in B and C. We chose uh, photostimulation patterns that approximate either slow gasping breathing or like a normal breathing pattern. And in fact, as you can see, it had no effect. And the, the, breathe, the apnea persists. If you kind of squint, probably up here, you can see right after the apnea, it does, it does inhibit breathing once breathing, breathing comes back naturally. So it works, but not during the apnea. We've done this in several mice now, so this is, this is consistent. Um, so this isn't what we uh, hypothesized. Of course, that's what a hypothesis is. It can be right or wrong. So perhaps instead of um, being tonically active, the inspiratory oscillator is actually inactive, and we need to stimulate it. <clears throat> so we're, we're running experiments for that now, um, where we stimulate what's called the retrotrapezoid nucleus, and this is a group of excitatory neurons that have a powerful excitatory impact on the inspiratory oscillator. And we have some data on it, although it's a little more limited. So you can see um, that when we stimulate the retrotrapezoid nucleus, the RTN, we can double the breathing frequency, uh, so a very powerful effect. But once again, when we stimulate uh, during the seizure, during the apnea, it has no impact on the apnea. You can kind of see right at the end of the photostimulation, once breathing has come back naturally, normally, um, we, we have an increase in breathing due to the stimulation, um, but not during the apnea. So it would seem that whether we stimulate the inspiratory oscillator or we inhibit the inspiratory oscillator, we can generate no effect, which is actually kind of impressive. Um, and so the conclusion from this is that, in fact, the inspiratory oscillator is bypassed. And um, this could make quite a bit of sense. So um, the ventral medulla is very important for homeostatic breathing, like when we're sleeping or when we're anesthetized uh, in those types of situations where we don't have as much higher brain function. Um, but there are other pathways that are important for doing things like what I'm doing right now, like talking. This isn't homeostatic breathing, this is behavioral breathing where I need to control my breaths very carefully um, to, uh, to get the words out. In fact, there are people who have injuries to certain parts of the brain and they can't uh, proceed to say long sentences because they start breathing on top of it. And that's where I'm putting my black box now. It's in the ponds. There are some known neuronal groups that are um, important, uh, that receive inputs from the cortex and other higher brain structures um, to modulate breathing. And there's some evidence that they can project past the inspiratory oscillator to premotor and motor neurons. There's less work on some of these parts of the brain, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but there has been some more recently uh, that we, are going, we have some new mouse models that we're, we're getting going and we're going to explore some of these. Um, as well as just trying to understand the neural circuitry involved in these seizures in general it is listed here. The inferior colliculus we find is quite important for some of these seizure behaviors. And you know, after the previous talk, talking about genetic uh, modifications and, uh, to, the, to the gene, but we don't want to suppress too much SCN8A in, in the brain, finding some of these targets that could reduce um, the most negative aspects of the seizures while preserving function in other parts of the brain, I think could be really beneficial down the line as some of these technologies grow. So that's some of our motivation. And with that, I just want to acknowledge members of the lab that have been very helpful. Uh, the group at UVA, uh, I started working on epilepsy four years ago with really no knowledge of, of this field, so I, I've learned a lot, I think. Um, the funding, uh, and I want to thank all of you for your attention at this late hour, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All the people that ask questions sit at the back of the room. <laughs> I'm getting my exercise in. Hey Ian, it's a, it's a really cool project. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, um, so I, I like the model that you proposed that maybe the, the, um, that the circuit is being bypassed, but I'm also wondering if the inputs from um, the bots in your complex just aren't strong enough to overcome what other inputs it's presumably fighting against that happened during the seizure. Yeah. Do you think that's um, possible? It's possible, although, so I've, in 
one of the ways I was going to test that <laughs> was to draw this inhibition out longer and longer. And I, 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 the times where I've done that, they've, they've, they died. And I would presume that it's about as strong of a, at least of a natural input you can get um, to drive breathing, and yet we overcome it with this preparation. So I, I, it's a pretty strong effect that we have. Yeah. Have you tried just directly activating those cells with like a stimulation, electrical stimulation, or maybe of the genetics, like of the inspiratory oscillator? Yeah, or exactly, the inspiratory so oscillator. I'm using that term because it it really comprises a somewhat heterogeneous group of neurons, and exactly how to stimulate it properly, I've never seen anybody really do do it. Uh, so I wouldn't know how to go about it, but that would be an interesting one. Or I mean, the best thing we could do would be to stimulate motor neurons. But putting fiber optics in the spinal cord, especially the, the most uh, dorsal parts of it, uh, yeah, ventral parts of it, would be is, is prohibitive at this point. So, so I haven't attempted that. Okay, one last question here. Uh, no, I wonder whether you have a perhaps a control group for for this experiment because. Part of that, it's very interesting, but part of that seems to be quite the basic mechanism of the spreading depression leading to the, the apnea, which is the base, basic and suited, but it's quite a fundamental mechanism. So it's not surprising that the, 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 the frontal lobes are not, I mean, provoking a tonic seizure, not involving that much in the, in the fetal apnea, and the apnea seems to be related to the, uh, the persistent inhibition of the brainstem. This is quite well known. So I wonder, how you can discriminate for something which is very specific for SGNAD for something which is more uh, basic mechanism for that? Um, are you asking, is this specific to SCN8A? Yes. Yes. I, I don't think so. The, uh, I, I didn't show it here, but in, I've done some kindling models and PTZ that induce fatal seizures, and it's a very similar um, observation that we get. So I think that at least... Um, you know, at a large picture level, uh, you get these tonic phase, you get the apnea, and sometimes you get lack of recovery, and that's a, that's a common. But this reminds me, the animal models for syrup is exactly the same, not mutated, I mean, down this. Yeah, it's probably not specific to the mutation itself, this is true. Thank you, Ian. All right, we will now play our Memorial Moments video to honor our SCNAA angels. Good evening. My name is Liz Ramirez, and I'm a volunteer with the Cute Syndrome Foundation and the mom of Will, who passed away in 2017 from SUDEP. Every year during our annual gathering, we spend time remembering and missing our loved ones with SCNAA who are no longer with us. To our families here, both virtually and in person, thank you for continuing to be my community. Although I'm no longer actively parenting a child with SCNA Day, I consider you to be my people. I know that we share in the same joys and heartaches that come with loving a family member with SCNA Day, even if we've never met before. I rejoice with you in your children's victories, however small they may be by the world's standards, and I shed tears with you when your children struggle, suffer, and experience setbacks. And to the clinicians, researchers, and industry professionals here this evening, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I am here to tell you that your work matters more than I am able to convey in words. The stretches of seizure freedom that my son Will experienced in his life had such a direct impact on his quality of life and on that of our entire family. When his seizures were well controlled, it afforded our family so many moments of joy and respite, and we never took those times for granted. Because we only got to be with Will for seven short years, each day without a seizure was a precious gift to us. So I want to say thank you to everyone here for taking this time to remember, honor, and grieve those who lived with SCNA Day and are no longer with us, and for your collective work in creating a more hopeful future for those continuing their courageous battles with SCNA Day. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Liz. And to all of our other bereaved parents that have shared your loved ones with us, thank you. I've watched our Memorial Moments video for six years now, and it never gets easier, and the list continues to grow. In fact, we've had another loss only three days ago. It's this uncertainty that each parent in this room and watching at home are wondering in fear right now. When will my child's name end up on that video? Will it be next year? Five years, 10 years from now? Will they live a life full of joy, smiles and giggles, or filled with seizures, hospitalizations and suffering? Families, as I look around this room and after hearing presentations today, I feel hopeful for our children's future. And I hope you do too. Professionals, as we go home to our families and our friends and we return to work, please remember our angels. Let their names and their faces drive us to continue to fight, to energize us, to continue to work together as a driving force behind striving for clinical excellence. Before we close for the evening, we're gonna close on a little bit of a, a happier note. I'd like to take a moment to present our 2022 Cuties Award. After the first SNAA clinician, researcher, and family gathering held in 2015, TCSF saw a handful of individuals rising to the opportunity to work collaboratively to improve the health and safety of those living with SNAA. As a result, we created the Cuties, our annual awards for champions for understanding, treating, investigating, and empowering those with SNAA. Typically, we present three awards going to a researcher, clinician, and family member that have gone above and beyond for our community. But this year, we've only chose one. You see, this person has worked tirelessly for this community since the very beginning. She's not a clinician or a researcher, but I believe that she's probably worthy of an honorary degree in both. She's a mother that in the midst of her darkest days rose above to fight for her child then took on fighting for all of our kids. She made herself and the SNA community be seen within the epilepsy space. Even when our community was less than 100 people, she stood tall and she made people listen. She saw that our children deserve better and she was committed to finding people to help her fight. And she did it, many of them in the room right now. She found clinicians, she found researchers, she found multiple industry partners that fight along our side. I could go on and on about the recipient of this year's cuties, but I think you will all agree that she is more than deserving of this award. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Hilary Savoy. You have to come up and get it. <laughs> I made her cry. I wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one crying up here. So, you know, before dinner, we're like, man, we are running on time. We are doing fantastic. 
and we jinxed it, and we are way over time. But um, I do want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors for tonight. We have two platinum sponsors, Praxis Precision Medicine and Neurochrome Biosciences, and then we have a silver sponsor, Gen Up. You guys, we could not do this without you. Thank you so very much um, for making this magical event happen every year. Thank you, John and Minaj, for helping me. Gosh, this is my first year, and I'm like, please keep doing this. Um, so thank you so much for, for finding our presenters and, um, and moderating today. And then our presenters, our researchers, clinicians, thank you so much for all the work that you do, but also coming here today to present. Um, also, gosh, thank you so much to the TCS volunteers. I was going to have you stand, but I think like most of them probably were just exhausted and had to go to bed. So I know there are a few out here. Um, if you guys want to just raise your hand and, and let you know that we're here, thank you guys so much. And because I'm up here, I also want to thank my executive committee. Um, we have four amazing women, um, three right there and one in the back, that not only um, welcomed me with open arms in this role, but have lifted me up with their support day after day, and I thank you guys so much. This has been an absolute amazing night. Thank you so much, and I continue, or I'm looking forward to continuing our conversations at the bar like normal. So with that, we will close. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next year.